And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years, and beget a son in his own likeness, after his own image, and called his name Seth. Genesis 5.3 Information in Book 2, Adam and Eve, explains that Seth was conceived, then born seven years after the death of Abel. Adam also named Seth, that means God has heard my prayer, his sadness over Abel's death, and has delivered me out of my affliction. But it also means power and strength. Following the deaths of Adam and Eve, Seth became the head of the house of Adam. He and his descendants continued to live on God's holy mountain and continued on in the priesthood. After Seth died, the headship was then passed on to Enos, then to Kenan, to Mahalil, to Jared, to Enoch, to Methuselah, to Lamech, and then to Noah, who begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. After the birth of Seth and Achli his son Enos, then men began to invoke the Lord by name, Genesis 4.26, and thus began the establishment of deity worship and the struggle between evil and good on earth among mankind. The struggle in the Middle East between the children of Seth and the children of Cain was a microcosm. Satan and his fallen angels established their rule over the children of Cain and built a magnificent civilization at the foot of the mountain complete with music and strong drink, which served to increase the lust among them. When Baruch asked to see the tree through which the serpent deceived Eve and Adam, an angel explained to Baruch that the tree was the grape, the vine, the tree is sinful desire, which Sataniel spread over Eve and Adam. And because of this, God has cursed the vine, because Sataniel had planted it. And by the vine, he deceived the protoplast Adam and Eve. Satan and his co-conspirators bequeathed knowledge of the worst kind upon mankind. And when they were drunk, hatred and murder increased among them. Then sin increased among them greatly, until a man married his own daughter or mother, or the daughter of his father's sister, until there was no distinction of relationship, and they no longer knew what was iniquity. And Satan taught them to make dyeing stuffs for garments of diverse patterns, and made them understand how to dye crimson and purple and what not. And the sons of Cain who wrought all this, and shone in beauty and gorgeous apparel, gathered together at the foot of the mountain in splendor, with horns and gorgeous dresses and horse races, committing all manner of abominations. Book 2, Adam and Eve, 28, 13, and 14. By the time Enos was 800 years old, Cain, who had married his sister, Awan, in the Book of Jubilees, had a large progeny, for they married frequently, being given to animal lusts until the land below the mountain was filled with them. Book 2, Adam and Eve, 12, 16. When Jared became the head of the family of Seth, he admonished his people to not descend the mountain and join the children of Cain, who hung about at the foot of the mountain day and night to tempt the descendants of Seth to come down. However, in time most gave in to the temptation and defected and went down from God's holy mountain and joined them. After the death of Jared, only Enoch, Methuselah, and Lamech Noah and Noah's family were left on the mountain. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Genesis 5.24 After Enoch became God's scribe, he wrote down all that was revealed to him in the secrets of the creation in 366 books, and was then allowed to return to earth and give the books to his sons and to admonish them about what was to come. Jude 14 and Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which, the, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. Enoch also warned them of the impending flood, and that Noah and his family would be the only humans to survive it. 2 Enoch 39 And Methuselah lived a hundred eighty and seven years, and begat Lamech. Lamech lived a hundred and eighty-two years, and begat a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Genesis 5.25 
28 through 29. Because Adam and Eve were the new and improved species of mankind, their descendants lived as perpetual youths for more than a hundred years before they were able to bear children, then for hundreds of years more after that. However, that longevity decreased as time passed. The descendants of Adam up to Noah had lived between 65 and 182 years, each before they reached a level of biological maturity that allowed them to produce offspring or to beget. Yet Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Genesis 5.32 In this account of Noah's birth, information in the Ethiopian Apocalypse of Enoch tells why the people knew Noah was special, and it also explains why he lived for such a long time before producing children. And his body was white as snow, and red as a rose, and the hair of his head as white as wool, and his demdema, his curly hair, or his afro, beautiful. And as for his eyes, when he opened them, the whole house glowed like the sun. And when he arose from the hands of the midwife, he opened his mouth and spoke to the Lord with righteousness. Lamech was afraid of him and fled. And he said to Methuselah, He is not like an ordinary human being, but he looks like the children of the angels of heaven to me. His form is different and he is not like us. His eyes are like the rays of the sun, and his face glorious. It does not seem to me that he is of me, but of angels. 106, 2 through 6, excerpts. And his body was white as snow and red as a rose. Now Methuselah knew where to find the transformed Enoch, and went to a dwelling place among the angels, at the ends of the earth, on Lamech's behalf. Enoch explained to his son, the purpose of this special being called Noah. There shall be a great destruction upon the earth, and there shall be a deluge for one year. And this son who has been born unto you shall be left upon the earth, and his three sons shall be saved when they who are upon the earth are dead. And upon the earth they shall give birth to giants, not of the spirit of, but of the flesh. There shall be a great plague upon the earth, and the earth shall be washed clean from all the corruption. Verses 16 through 18. Genesis 6 in Tanakh, the Holy Scriptures, reads, When men began to increase on earth and daughters were born to them, the divine beings, the Grigori, the watchers, the overseers, saw how beautiful the daughters of men were and took wives from among those that pleased them. It was then that the Nephilim appeared on earth, when the divine beings cohabited with the daughters of men who bore them offspring. They were the heroes of old, the men of renown. 6, 1-4 through four excerpts, and that's the Tanakh. Genesis 6, 4 in the King James Bible reads, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children with them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Job 1, 6 now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The phrase sons of God means simply that God created them. So in that respect, Satan and his rebellious followers were all sons of God. Some of these fallen angels were the watchers, or those whose responsibility it was to monitor and supervise mankind's activities and progress in their assigned sectors of earth, and then report back to God. When Enoch was taken and placed in the fifth heaven, he saw them imprisoned there. Quote, Enoch 18, 1 through 4. He saw many and countless soldiers called Gregory of human appearance, and their size was greater than that of great giants. And they, the angels, said to me, These are the Gregory, who with their prince Sataniel rejected the Lord of Light and two hundred myriads. And three of them went down on the earth from the Lord's throne to the place Ermon, Mount Hermon, on the northeast boundary of Palestine, and broke through their vows on the shoulder of the hill Ermon, and saw the daughters of men how good they are, and took to themselves wives, and befouled the earth with their deeds, who in all times of their age made lawlessness and mixing, and giants were born, and marvelous big men, and great enmity. The Gregori, who appeared like men, were biologically compatible with human females. 
Through sexual intercourse, they gave rise to a species of men whose flesh or physical constitution was corrupt, according to the precepts of God. As a result of this mixing of two different species, mutations occurred, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. After the rebellious watchers took wives unto themselves, they began to teach their wives and their offspring. From Scripture, they taught humans eternal secrets which are performed in heaven, the art of making swords, knives, shields, and breastplates, bracelets, decorations, all kinds of precious stones, and alchemy, and there were many wicked ones, and they committed adultery, and all their conduct became corrupt. Amazras, as opposed to Amaros, so because this is a different reading, taught incantation, and the cutting of roots, astrology, and the knowledge of the signs, and the seeing of the stars, the course of the moon, as well as the deception of men. Furthermore, these giants consumed the produce of all the people until the people detested feeding them. So the giants turned against the people in order to eat them. And they began to sin against birds, wild beasts, reptiles, and fish. And the flesh was devoured one by the other, and they drank blood. Then Michael, Surafel, and Gabriel observed carefully from the sky, and they saw much blood being shed upon the earth. That's 1 Enoch 7-9 through nine excerpts. This reading is, is from a different, a different translation, apparently, that has slightly different wording. Enoch told his sons that he had also been informed that the children of the Watchers would arise again after the flood, just as God had told them. After that, so this is scripture again, 1 Enoch 106, 19. After that, the flood, there shall occur still greater oppression than that which was fulfilled upon the earth the first time. For I do know the mysteries of the Holy One. For he, the Lord, revealed them to me, and made me know, and I have read them in the heavenly tablets. 1 Enoch 106, 19. According to Barosus, the ancient Sumerian king Gilgamesh, circa 2750 BC, was renowned for his great strength, but also for his cruelty and oppressiveness towards his subjects. He claimed that he was one-third human and two-thirds God, and should therefore not have to die and afterwards be consigned to the netherworld. He thus embarked on a perilous journey in a futile effort to find the secrets of immortality, but ultimately failed. Several Assyrian Babylonian boss reliefs depict Gilgamesh as being a giant. On one he is holding a lion, and on the other watering a bull. In direct proportion to the size of these modern-day animals, his height was at least twice that of the average human male of today, even more if he was watering a bull. It is written in the Gilgamesh epic that when Enkidu, Gilgamesh's companion, approached a group of shepherds, they said to each other, He, Enkidu, is like Gilgamesh, twice the size of ordinary men. The fairy, tablet 2, column 1, lines 11 and 12. An archaic stele housed in the Louvre Museum shows the Assyrio-Babylonian god Shamash seated while a human female waters his sacred plant. The stele of Hammurabi also kept at the Louvre, likewise shows Shamash seated while he dictates his laws to Hammurabi. On both stella, even while seated, one can see that this god was of giant proportions. A votive relief of the great god Asclepius and his family shows humans paying homage to him. Again, in direct proportion to the human in this illustration, the height of this god would be at about eight feet. Likewise, a votive relief showing the, re the goddess Persephone Pouring a liquid atop the head of an initiate renders her to be at least twice the height and three times the size of the human cult member. The same holds true for Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, portrayed on a relief sculpture with human horsemen or hunters. A rock painting at Diana's Vow Farm near Rusape, Rhodesia, has been dated back to 3000 BC after the flood. It depicts a crowd of people gathering around a large, centralized humanoid figure that is about six times their height. This figure, depicted as wearing a mask, or of actually having the head of an antelope, is most likely a god. In many ancient cultures, the resident god was synonymous with kingship, just as it was with Gilgamesh, a god-king. Other post-Diluvian giants are mentioned in Numbers 13, 32, and 33, as inhabiting the land of Canaan, to the west of the Jordan River. 
And they, scouts, brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched into the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, Gregory, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. The sons of Anak were named in Joshua 15 and 14 as being Sheshai, Ahimon, and Talmai. These giants were cannibals, as were the Cyclops described in Homer's Odyssey, who were created by Poseidon, the Greek god of the sea. These would resurface after the Great Flood, as some of the descendants of Noah fell again under the influence of Satan and his legions of demons. The post-Diluvian giants built habitats for themselves, most notably at Petra, located in the desert of what is now southern Jordan. They dwelt in the land of Ammon, as is written in Deuteronomy 2. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zemzumim, a great people, and many, and tall as the An-Akim, the Anak. But the Lord destroyed them, the An-Akim, before them, and they, the Zamzumim, succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. That's 20 and 21 of Joshua. And as is mentioned, the Satans created creatures whose antecessors also resurfaced after the Catechismic Flood. These hybrids are the creatures of mythology. The mermaids, centaurs, cyclops, griffins, basilisks, dragons, leviathan, the Lernaean hydra, the dogs of hell, orthos and cerberus, the minotaur, and the like. The apocryphal book Baruch notes the destruction of the hybrid giants. There were the giants famous from the beginning, that were of so great stature and so expert in war. Those did not the Lord choose, neither gave he the way of knowledge unto them. But they were destroyed because they had no wisdom, and perished through their own foolishness. 3.26 and 28. That's the book of Baruch. In his epic poem, The Odyssey, Greek poet Homer describes the giants as louts without a law to bless them, who lived in isolation from each other, and who dealt out rough justice to wife and child. The Greek version of 3 Baruch puts the number of giants that were destroyed at 409,000. It is important to note here that regardless of the physical form of any human being today, the souls of the victims of Satan's wickedness against all humanity are saved if they believe and trust in God and follow his commandments. Before Enoch was taken for the final time, he admonished his sons to remain in the priesthood of Almighty God. And I swear to you, yea, yea, that there has been no man in his mother's womb, but that already before, even to each one there is a place prepared for the repose of that soul, and a measure fixed how much it is intended that a man be tried in this world. Yes, children, deceive not yourselves, for there has been previously prepared a place for every soul of man, and every grievous and cruel yoke that come upon you, Bear all for the sake of the Lord, and thus you will find your reward in the day of judgment. 2 Enoch 49-52 through 52 excerpts During that age of human degeneration, the population on earth had grown rapidly to nearly 6 million. God had decided initially to destroy all living creatures from the face of the earth via a, glo via a global flood, and to thereby put into effect a total recall of all human souls. However, Noah, like Adam, was a special creation, and he and his family were selected to survive that mass extinction. Noah and his family were found to be perfect in their generations. They therefore met God's two basic criteria of survival for that time. First, they were at once both spiritually and physically fit, meaning neither their spirit nor their genetic makeup had been adulterated by that evil species, those hellish beings, the fallen angels. And second, the family was genetically varied enough to continue to produce humans with the proper attributes necessary to repopulate the entire earth. God sent Asuriel, his angel, to the son of Lamech to warn him about the impending deluge and that he and his family would be preserved. 
And God saw that the wickedness of mankind was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6 5. HUD, Chapter 11 of the Holy Quran, verse 39 reads And he, Noah, started making the ark. And every time the chiefs of his people passed him by, they mocked at him. And he said, If now you mock at us, the time is coming when we shall mock at you, even just as you mock now. The Chaldean Persian Sibyl was Sambith, Noah's daughter in law. She recorded how before the flood, Noah had urged the people of his time to repent their sins, but they sneered at him, each one calling him demented, a man gone mad. First Sibyl, lines 171 and 172. So that's the goddess Sibyl. And that was Noah's daughter in law. Noah, however, continued pleading with the people, and even went so far as to tell them what would happen to them. You will laugh with a bitter smile when this flood comes to pass. I say, the terrible and strange water of God. Whenever the abominable race of Rhea disappears, root and all, in a single night, and the earth-shaking land quaker will scatter cities complete with their inhabitants, and the hiding places of the earth and will undo walls, then also the entire world of innumerable men will die. Lines 182 through 190. The exploits and avatars of the ancient goddess Rhea, the daughter of Gaia and Uranus and sister and wife to Cronus, are noted in chapter 2 of this book. The abominable race of Rhea refers not only to her own offspring, Hera, Hestia, Demeter, Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon, but also to those who worshipped her and the other fallen angels. When God instructed Noah to take the clean beasts and fowls of the air by sevens, he meant seven each of the male and seven of the female for a total of fourteen, and yet they were two and two. In this ark were eight humans and creatures from every sector of earth. Every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, and every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. Genesis seven fourteen and 15 The extinction that came about as a result of this global flood was a partial extinction, as God's post-diluvian life forms were the same as the antediluvian ones. Furthermore, the seventh-day extinction was not about completely eliminating and then recreating plant and animal life on earth, as the earth's ecosystems were already in equilibrium and there was no need for this. This was one about eliminating the hybrids that Satan created, and those humans who, through Satan's clever devices, had become physically and spiritually unfit and corrupt. And God saw that the wickedness of mankind was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6.5 Okay, so today I'm going to go about the conditions in paradise. What I'm reading to you from is the Cave of Treasures, the book of the Cave of Treasures. So just to open it up, I'm going to start with this portion so that you understand what the, the content will be like. Now Moses, the prophet, said that God planted paradise in Eden and placed Adam there. Genesis 2, 8. Notes. Paradise was situated on Mount Eden, beyond the ocean, and it was filled with fruit-bearing trees. The great river, which sprung up in it, was parted into four heads, viz. The Pishon, which flowed through Havilah, where there were barrels and gold and stones of price, the Gihon, or the Nile of Egypt, the Decloth, or the Tigris, which flows through Assyria, and the Parath, the Euphrates. The keepers of paradise were Enoch and Elijah, and in it dwelt the souls of the righteous. The souls of sinners dwelt in a deep place outside Eden. 
The tree of good and evil that was in paradise did not possess these properties naturally, but only through the deed which was wrought by its means. Adam and Eve did not become naked and die the death of sin because they desired and ate of the fruit of the fig tree, but because they transgressed the law. Okay, so that's just the one portion that I'll read it to start with. And the reason that I'm going to start there and point that out is that for the focus on the North Pole. And so we'll get into it. the next part is the symbolism of Eden. And you'll see how, again, it ties it up and makes it very clear where Eden is. Eden is the Holy Church. And the Church is the compassion of God, which he was about to extend to the children of men. For God, according to his knowledge, knew what Satan had devised against Adam, and therefore he set Adam beforehand in the bosom of his compassion, even as the blessed Davis singeth concerning him in the psalm, XC, saying, Lord, thou hast been an abiding place for us throughout all generations. That is to say, thou hast made us to have our abiding place in thy compassion. And when entreating God on behalf of the redemption of the children of men, David said, Remember thy church, which thou didst acquire in olden time. Psalm LXXIV 2 That is to say, Remember thy compassion, which thou art about to spread over our feeble race. So Eden is the holy church, and the paradise which was in it is the land of rest and the inheritance of life, which God hath prepared for all the holy children of men. And because Adam was priest and king and prophet, God brought him into paradise that he might minister in Eden, the holy church, even as the blessed man Moses testifieth concerning him, saying, that he might serve God by means of priestly ministration with praise, and that he might keep that commandment which had been entrusted to him by the compassion of God. And God made Adam and Eve to dwell in paradise. True is this word, and it proclaimeth the truth. That tree of life which was in the midst of paradise prefigured the redeeming cross, which is the veritable tree of life. And this it was that was fixed in the middle of the earth. So that's the point that I wanted to get to there. That the tree of life, which was the prefigured the redeeming cross, so the cross is the veritable tree of life, that it was fixed in the middle of the earth. And that we're talking about that Eden is in the middle of the earth and the tree of life is in the middle of Eden and so it's in the middle of the earth which is the North Pole I just wanted to start there so that you guys understand that portion and then I'm gonna carry on with this story I'm gonna read you this story because it's amazing it talks about so many amazing things and fills in a lot of the questions that people have about the Bible and about the story of when Satan was actually thrown out of heaven and some other interesting parts the cave of treasures the first 6,000 years and the first six days of creation the creation, the first day. In the beginning, on the first day, which was the holy first day of the week, the chief and firstborn of all the days, God created the heavens, and the earth, and the waters, and the air, and the fire, and the hosts which are invisible, that is to say, the angels, archangels, thrones, lords, principalities, powers, cherubim, and seraphim and all the ranks and companies of spiritual beings and the light and the night and the daytime and the gentle winds and the strong winds i.e. storms all of these were created on the first day and on the first day of the week the spirit of holiness one of the persons of the trinity hovered over the waters and through the hovering thereof over the face of the waters the waters were blessed so that they might become producers of offspring and they became hot and the whole nature of the waters glowed with heat, and the leaven of creation was united to them. As the mother bird maketh warm her young by the embrace of her closely covering wings, and the young birds acquire form through the warmth of the heat which they derive from her, so through the operation of the spirit of holiness, 
the spirit, the paraclete, the leaven of the breath of life was united to the waters when he hovered over them. Notes. According to Solomon, an Nestorian bishop of Parath Meishan, or al Basra, a city on the right bank of the Shat al Arab, about AD 1222, the creation of the heavens and the earth has been planned from everlasting and immutable mind of God. He created seven substances or natures in silence, without voice, the heaven, earth, water, air, fire, the angels, and darkness. The earth was plunged in the midst of the waters. Above the waters was air, and above the air was fire. Water is cold and moist. Air is hot and moist. Fire is hot and dry. But it had no luminosity until the fourth day, when the luminaries were created. The angels are divided into nine classes and three orders. The upper order contains cherubim, seraphim, and thrones, and these are bearers of God's throne. The middle order contains lords, powers, and rulers. The lower order contains principalities, archangels, and angels. Compare the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers of Colossians 1.16. The cherubim are an intellectual motion. The seraphim are a fiery motion. The thrones are a fixed motion. The lords are a motion which governs the motions beneath it and controls the devils. The powers are a motion which gives effect to God's will. The rulers are a motion which rules spiritual measures and the sun, moon, and stars. The principalities are a motion which rules the elements, the archangels are a swift operative motion which governs every living creature except man. And the angels are a motion which has spiritual knowledge of everything which is in heaven or on the earth. The guardian angel of every man belongs to this last class. The number of each class of angels is equal to the number of all mankind from Adam to the resurrection. The heaven in which the angels live is above the waters, which are above the firmament, and they minister to their God there, being invisible to bodily eyes. The angels are not self-existent beings, they were created. On the other hand, darkness is a self-existent nature or substance. Solomon of al Basra does not accept the view that the spirit which hovered over the waters was the Holy Spirit. See the Book of the Bee, Ed Budge, Chapters 1 through 7. The Creation, Second Day. And on the second day, God made the lower heaven and called it Rekia, that is to say, what is solid and fixed, or firmament. This he did, that he might make known that the lower heaven doth not possess the nature of the heaven which is above it and that it is different in appearance from that heaven which is above it, for the heaven above it is of fire, and that second heaven is nura, i.e. light, and this lower heaven is darpishion, and because it hath the dense nature of water, it hath been called rekia. And on the second day God made a separation between the waters and the waters, that is to say between the waters which are above rekia and the waters which were below. And the ascent of these waters which were above heaven took place on the second day. And they were like unto a dense black cloud of thick darkness. Thus were they raised up there, and they mounted up, and, behold, they stand above the rekia in the air, and they do not spread, and they make no motion to any side. Notes, according to the Book of the Bee, the creation of the firmament enabled God to allot a dwelling place to the angels where also the souls of the righteous could be received after the general resurrection. The great abyss of water which gave also the souls of the righteous could be received after the general resurrection. The great abyss of water which God created on the first day was divided by him into three parts. One part he left on the earth for the use of man and beast, 
and to form rivers and seas. Of the second part he made the firmament, and the third part the place above the firmament. After the resurrection all these parts will return to their original state. The word darpition is a difficulty and I cannot explain it. The variant forms dirikon and dertikon appear in Ethiopic books wherein it is said to be a name of the sixth heaven. The creation, third day. And on the third day God commanded the waters that were below the firmament, Rekia, to be gathered together in one place, and the dry land to appear. And when the covering of water had been rolled up from the face of the earth, the earth showed itself to be in an unsettled and unstable state. That is to say, it was of a damp or moist and yielding nature. And the waters were gathered together into seas that were under the earth and within it, and upon it. And God made in the earth from below corridors and shafts and channels for the passage of the waters. And the winds which come from within the earth ascend by means of these corridors and channels, and also the heat, and also the wind for the service of the earth. Now as for the earth, the lower part of it is like unto a thick sponge, for it resteth on the waters. And on this third day God commanded the earth, and it brought forth herbs and vegetables, and it conceived in its interior trees and seeds and plants and roots. Note, on this day the waters gathered together in the depths of the earth. Sand was set as a limit for the waters of the seas, and the mountains and hills appeared. And the sages say that paradise was created on this day, but the rabbis held the view that it existed before the world. Solomon of Albazra says that the earth produced herbs and trees by its own power, and that the luminaries had nothing to do with vegetable growth. Book of the Bee, Chapter 9 the creation, fourth day. And on the fourth day God made the sun and the moon and the stars. And as soon as the heat of the sun was diffused over the surface of the earth, the earth became hard and rigid, and lost its flaccidity, because the humidity and the dampness caused by the waters were taken away from it. The Creator made the sphere of the sun of fire and filled it with light. And God gave unto the sphere of the moon and the stars bodies of water and air and filled them with light. And God gave unto the sphere of the moon and the stars bodies of water and air, and filled them with light. And when the dust of the earth became hot, it brought forth all the trees and plants and seeds and roots which had been conceived inside it on the third day. Plate 1 Limestone monolith Pasargadai in Persia, sculptured in low relief with a portrait figure of the Fravashi or genius of Cyrus the Great, the friend of the Jews. The figure of Cyrus is rather larger than life size and is winged after the manner of gods and kings on the Assyrian bas reliefs, and the decoration of the hem of his garment is Assyrian in character. His crown was copied from some Egyptian bas relief sculptured with the figure of a king and represents the Horus Knemu or Amen, the two cobras of the upper and lower country, and the triple symbol of loyalty resting on solar disks and terminating in disks. The inscription, I am Cyrus, the king, the Achaemenian, has been broken off. Notes: The cases of the sun, moon, and stars were made of aerial or ethereal matter after the manner of lamps and God filled them with a mixture of fire which had no light in it, and with light which had no heat in it. The path of the luminaries is beneath the firmament. They are not fixed as the ignorant think, but are guided in their courses by the angels. The Ethiopians have a tradition that when the sun was first made, its light was twelve times as strong as it is today. The angels complained that the heat was too strong and that it hampered them in the performance of their duties whereupon God divided it into twelve parts. The Creation, Fifth Day And on the fifth day God commanded the waters, and they brought forth all kinds of fish di of diverse appearances, and creatures which move about and twist themselves and wriggle in the waters, and serpents, and leviathan, and beasts of terrible aspects, 
and feathered fowl of the air and of the waters. And on this same day God made from the earth all the cattle and wild beasts, and all the reptiles which creep about upon the earth. Notes, according to the Book of the Bee, Chapter 12, beasts and animals were created on Friday evening, and they can therefore see at night as well as in the daytime. In the Book of Mysteries of Heaven and Earth, whales and the behemoth are mentioned with Leviathan. The Creation, Sixth Day. And on the sixth day, which is the eve of the Sabbath, God formed man out of the dust, and Eve from his rib. And on the seventh day God rested from his labors, and it is called Sabbath, the creation of Adam. Now the formation of Adam took place in this wise. On the sixth day, which is the eve of the Sabbath, at the first hour of the day, when, when quietness was reigning over all the ranks of the angels and the hosts of heaven, God said, Come ye, let us make man in our image, and according to our likeness. Now by this word, us, he maketh known concerning the glorious persons of the Trinity. And when the angels heard this utterance, they fell into a state of fear and trembling. And they said to one another, A mighty miracle will be made manifest to us this day, that is to say, the likeness of God, our Maker. And they saw the right hand of God opened out flat and stretched out over the whole world, and all creatures were lected in the palm of his right hand. And they saw that he took from the whole mass of the earth one grain of dust, and from the whole nature of water one drop of water, and from all the air which is above one puff of wind, and from the whole nature of fire a little of its heat and warmth. And the angels saw that when these four feeble or inert materials were placed in the palm of his right hand, that is to say, wind and heat and dryness and moisture, God formed Adam. Now, for what reason did God make Adam out of these four materials, unless it were to show that everything which is in the world should be in subordination to him through them? He took a grain from the earth in order that everything in nature which is formed of earth should be subject unto him, and a drop of water in order that everything which is in the seas and rivers should be his, and a puff of air so that all kinds of creatures which fly in the air might be given unto him and the heat of fire so that all the beings that are fiery in nature and the celestial hosts might be his helpers. God formed Adam with his holy hands in his own image and likeness. And when the angels saw Adam's glorious appearance, they were greatly moved by the beauty thereof. For they saw the image of his face burning with glorious splendor like the orb of the sun. And the light of his eyes was like the light of the sun and the image of his body was like unto the sparkling of crystal. And when he rose at full length and stood upright in the center of the earth, he planted his two feet on that spot whereupon was set up the cross of our Redeemer. For Adam was created in Jerusalem. There he was arrayed in the apparel of sovereignty, and there was the crown of glory set upon his head. There was he made king and priest and prophet. There did God make him to sit upon his honorable throne. And there did God give him dominion over all creatures and things. And all the wild beasts and all the cattle and the feathered fowl were gathered together. And they passed before Adam, and he assigned names to them. And they bowed their heads before him. And everything in nature worshipped him, and submitted themselves unto him. And the angels and the hosts of heaven heard the voice of God saying unto him, Adam, behold, I have made thee king and priest and prophet and lord and head and governor of everything which hath been made and created. And they shall be in subjection unto thee, and they shall be thine. And I have given unto thee power over everything which I have created. And when the angels heard this speech, they all bowed the knee and worshipped him. Notes, the Jews consider that the words, Come, let us make man, refer to God and the angels. But the fathers of the Syrian church understand that God refers to the three persons of the Trinity, some fathers believe that Adam was formed on the morning of the sixth day, outside paradise. But others think that the formation of Adam took place in the evening in paradise. According to some, paradise was created before the world, and according to others, on the third day. Bar Hebraeus says that Adam was created on Friday of the first week of Nisan, April, the 
the first month of the first year of the world. So Nisan is supposed to be New Year's. The Egyptian and Ethiopian churches have a tradition that the angels were not all created at the same time. The great Archangel Michael, who is called the Angel of the Face, and all his rank of angels were created in the first hour of Friday. The priests in the second, and the thrones in the third. The dominions or sultans in the fourth hour of Friday. The lords in the fifth, and the powers in the sixth. The tens of thousands in the seventh. The governors in the eighth. The masters in the ninth. After the governors, the rank of angels governed by Satan were created, and then the tenth rank. According to a Coptic tradition preserved in the Discourse on Abaton, the Angel of Death by Timothy, Archbishop of Rakoti, Alexandria, the clay of which Adam was made was brought by the angel Muriel from the land of the east. When God had made his body, he left it lying for forty days and forty nights without putting breath into it. At the request of our Lord, who promised to become Adam's advocate and to go down into the world, God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life three times, saying, Live, 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 according to the type of my divinity. Thereupon Adam rose up and worshipped the Father, saying, My Lord and my God. Budge Coptic Martyrdoms, page 482. The Revolt of Satan and the Battle in Heaven. And when the prince of the lower order of angels saw what great majesty had been given unto Adam, he was jealous of him from that day, and he did not wish to worship him. And he said unto his hosts, Ye shall not worship him, and ye shall not praise him with the angels. It is meet that ye should worship me, because I am fire and spirit, and not that I should worship a thing of dust, which hath been fashioned of fine dust. And the rebel, made it, and the rebel meditating these things, would not render obedience to God, and of his own free will he asserted his independence and separated himself from God. But he was swept away out of heaven and fell, and the fall of himself and of all his company from heaven took place on the sixth day, at the second hour of the day. And the apparel of their glorious state was stripped off them, and his name was called Satana, because he turned aside from the right way, and Shaddah, because he was cast out, and Daiwa, because he lost the apparel of his glory. And behold, from that time until the present day, he and all his hosts have been stripped of their apparel, and they go naked and have horrible faces. And when Satana was cast out from heaven, Adam was raised up so that he might ascend to paradise in a chariot of fire. And the angels went before him, singing praises, and the seraphim ascribed holiness unto him, and the cherubim ascribed blessing, and amid cries of joy and praises Adam went into paradise. And as soon as Adam entered paradise, he was commanded not to eat of a certain tree. His entrance into heaven took place at the third hour of the eve of the Sabbath, i.e. on Friday morning. Notes: The fathers of the Egyptian and Ethiopian churches treat the story of the fall of Satan in great detail. According to them, Satan, or Satnael, was greatly astonished at the beauty and splendor of the sun and moon. And on the fourth day of the week, he declared to himself that he would set his throne above the stars and make himself equal to God. One week after the creation of Adam, Satan declared war on the hosts of Almighty God. These were commanded by Michael and consisted of 120,000 horsemen, 600,000 shield bearers, 700,000 mail-clad horsemen in chariots of fire, 700,000 torchbearers, 800,000 angels with daggers of fire, 1 million slingers, 500,000 bearers of axes of fire, and 300,000 bearers of fiery crosses, and 400,000 bearers of lamps. The angels uttered their battle cries and began to fight, but Satan charged them and dispersed them. They reformed, but again Satan charged them and put them to flight. Then God gave the angels the cross of light, which bore the legend, In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And when they attacked the hosts of darkness under his cross, Satan became faint, and he and his forces withdrew, and Michael hurled them down into hell. 
The Abyssinian legend says that Satan was 1,700 cubits high, and his hand 70 cubits long, and his foot 7,000 cubits long. His mouth was 40 cubits in width. His face was as broad as the distance of a day's journey, and the length of his eyebrows was a distance of three days' journey. From the Book of the Mysteries of Heaven and Earth From the Book of the Mysteries of Heaven and Earth The prototype of the great fight in heaven between the powers of light and darkness is found in ancient Egyptian religious texts, in more than one form. In the oldest form, Set, the devil, rebels against her -er, the god of heaven whose chief symbol are the sun and moon, and is utterly defeated. In the next form, Set attacks the sun god Ra, and is destroyed by him. The great ally of Set, called Apep or Apophis, and all his friends and devils, the Sibo or Subao, are defeated and burnt up daily. In another form, Set makes war on Horus, the son of Osiris, and on Osiris himself, and is defeated utterly. The Coptic version of the legend was borrowed from the old hieroglyphic texts and then Christianized. Compare the following. When Satan saw Adam seated on a great throne with a crown of glory on his head and a scepter in his hand, and all the angels worshipping him, he was filled with anger. And when God said to him, Come, thou also, for thou shalt worship my image and likeness, Satan refused to do so. And, assuming an arrogant and insolent manner, he said, it is meet that he should worship me, for I existed before he came into being. When the father saw his overbearing attitude, he knew that Satan's wickedness and rebellion had reached their highest pitch. He ordered the celestial soldiers to take from him the written authority that was in his hand, to strip off his armor, and to hurl him down from heaven to earth. Satan was the greatest of the angels, and God had made him the commander-in-chief of the celestial hosts and in the document which Satan held in his hand were written the names of all the angels under his command. Knowing their names, his authority over them was absolute. When God saw that the angels hesitated to take the document from him, he commanded them to bring a sharp reaping knife and to stab him on this side and that, right through his body to the backbone and shoulder blades, and Satan could no longer stand upright. And a cherub smote him and broke his wings and his ribs, and having rendered him helpless, he cast Satan down from heaven upon the earth. Then he became the archdevil and the leader of those who were, who were cast out of heaven with him, and who henceforth were devils. From Budge, Coptic Martyrdoms, page 484. The Making of Eve And God cast a sleep upon Adam, and he slept. And God took a rib from the loins on the right side of Adam, and he made Kawa, i.e. Eve, from it. And when Adam woke up and saw Eve, he rejoiced in her greatly. And Adam and Eve were in paradise, and clothed with glory, and shining with praise for three hours. Now this paradise was situated on a high range of hills, and it was thirty spans, according to the measurement of the Spirit, higher than all the high mountains. And Notes, God did not make Eve of earth, that she might not be considered something alien to Adam in nature. And he did not take her from Adam's fore parts, that she might not uplift herself against him, nor from his hind parts, that she might not be accounted despicable, nor from his right side, that she might not have preeminence over him, nor from his head, that she might not seek authority over him, nor from his feet, that she might not be trodden down and scorned in the eyes of her husband. But he took her from his left side, for the side is the place which unites and joins both front and back. Book of the Bee, Chapter 14, and Bar Habreus Ausar Reis. Further, God did not form Eve from Adam's head, that she might not carry her head proudly, nor from his eye, that she might not be curious, nor from his ear, that she might not be an eavesdropper, nor from his mouth, that she might not be gossiping, nor from his heart, that she might not be quarrelsome, nor from his hand, that she might not touch everything with her hand nor from his feet that she might not rove about. Now Moses the prophet said that God planted paradise in Eden and placed Adam there, Genesis 2.8. Notes, paradise was situated on Mount Eden, 
beyond the ocean, and it was filled with fruit-bearing trees. The great river which sprung up in it was parted into four heads, viz. the Pishon, which flowed through Havila, where there were barrels, and gold and stones of price. The Gihon, or the Nile of Egypt, the Decloth, the Tigris, which flows through Assyria, and the Parath, or the Euphrates. The keepers of paradise were Enoch and Elijah, and in it dwelt the souls of the righteous. The souls of sinners dwelt in a deep place outside Eden. The tree of good and evil that was in paradise did not possess these properties naturally, but only through the deed which was wrought by its means. Adam and Eve did not become naked and die the death of sin because they desired and ate of the, of the fruit of the fig tree, but because they transgressed the law. The tree of which they ate may have been the fig tree, or the date palm, or the vine, or the ethrog, the citron. Mount Eden is probably the original of Jabal Kaf, of the Arabs. The Symbolism of Eden Now Eden is the Holy Church, and the Church is the compassion of God, which he was about to extend to the children of men. For God, according to his foreknowledge, knew what Satan had devised against Adam, and therefore he set Adam beforehand in the bosom of his compassion, even as the blessed Davis singeth concerning him in the psalm, XC, saying, Lord, thou hast been an abiding place for us throughout all generations. That is to say, thou hast made us to have our abiding place in thy compassion. And when entreating God on behalf of the redemption of the children of men, David said, Remember thy church, which thou didst acquire in olden time. Psalm LXXIV 2 That is to say, Remember thy compassion, which thou art about to spread over our feeble race. Eden is the holy church, and the paradise which was in it is the land of rest, and the inheritance of life, which God hath prepared for men, for all the holy children of men. And because Adam was priest and king and prophet, God brought him into paradise that he might minister in Eden, the holy church, even as the blessed man Moses testifieth concerning him, saying, that he might serve God by means of priestly ministration with praise, and that he might keep that commandment which had been entrusted to him by the compassion of God. And God made Adam and Eve to dwell in paradise. True is this word, and it proclaimeth the truth. That tree of life which was in the midst of paradise prefigured the redeeming cross, which is the veritable tree of life. And this it was that was fixed in the middle of the earth. Satan's Attack on Adam and Eve And when Satan saw that Adam and Eve were happy and joyful in paradise, that rebel was smitten sorely with jealousy, and he became filled with wrath. And he went up and took up his abode in the serpent, and he raised him up and made him to fly through the air to the skirts of Mount Eden, whereon was paradise. Now, why did Satan enter the body of the serpent and hide himself therein? Because he knew that his appearance was foul, and that if Eve saw his form, she would betake herself to flight straight away before him. Now the man who wished to teach the Greek language to a bird, now the bird that can learn the speech of men is called Babaga, i.e. the parrot. It first bringeth a large mirror and placeth between himself and the bird. He then beginneth to talk to the bird, and immediately the parrot heareth the voice of the man. It turneth round, and when it seeth its own form reflected in the mirror, it becometh pleased straight away, because it imagineth that a fellow parrot is talking to it. Then it inclineth its ear with pleasure, and listeneth to the words of the man who is talking to it, and it becometh eager to learn and to speak Greek. In this manner, i.e. with the object of making Eve believe that it was the serpent that spoke to her, did Satan enter in and dwell in the serpent, and he watched for the opportunity, and when he saw Eve by herself, he called her by her name. And when she turned round towards him, she saw her own form reflected in him, and she talked to him, and Satan led her astray with his lying words, because the nature of woman is soft or yielding. And when Eve had heard from him concerning that tree, straightway she ran quickly to it, and she plucked the fruit of disobedience from the tree of transgression of the command. 
and she ate. Then immediately she found herself stripped naked, and she saw the hatefulness of her shame, and she ran away naked and hid herself in another tree, and covered her nakedness with the leaves thereof. And she cried out to Adam, and he came to her, and she handed to him some of the fruit of which she had eaten, and he also did eat thereof. And when he had eaten, he also became naked. And he and Eve made girdles for their loins of the leaves of the fig trees. And they were arrayed in these girdles of ignominy for three hours. At midday they received their sentence of doom. And God made for them tunics of skin which was stripped from the trees. That is to say, of the bark of the trees, because the trees that were in paradise had soft barks. And they were softer than the, bis the byssus and silk wherefrom the garments worn by kings are made. And God dressed them in this soft skin, which was thus spread over a body of infirmities. Notes. The fathers of the Ethiopian church emphasized the difficulty which Satan found in entering paradise. He knew that he could not carry out his plan for ruining Adam if he entered paradise in his own form, and he decided that he must assume the form of some bird or animal or reptile if he was to succeed. He applied to the white bird Arzel and the green bird Basil and a red bird but each refused to take him to the place where Eve was. Then he applied to the elephant and the lion and the leopard and the hyena and the wild boar. The first four refused point blank to do what Satan wished, and the wild boar attempted to gore him with his tusks. On this Satan took to flight. He then went to the animal Sareg, which was commonly known as the digger of graves, but this animal refused to help him. And then Satan approached the animal called Taman, the front part of which was like a camel's foal. This creature agreed to help him, and, mounted on his back, Satan entered paradise and stood before Eve. The serpent became spokesman for him, and Eve hearkened to him and ate of the fruit, according to the book of the mysteries of heaven and earth. The tree was called Sezen, and each fruit cluster contained 150,000 grains or berries. It is described as a large and handsome tree, and it has been identified with the sandale or sandalwood tree. According to the same authorities, the tree of life was the prototype of the cross on which our Lord was crucified. Adam stay in paradise. At the third hour of the day, Adam and Eve ascended into paradise. And for three hours, they enjoyed the good things thereof. For three hours, they were in shame and disgrace. And at the ninth hour, their expulsion from paradise took place. And as they were going forth sorrowfully, God spake unto Adam, and heartened him, and said unto him, Be not sorrowful, Adam, for I will restore unto thee thine inheritance. Behold, see how greatly I have loved thee. For though I have cursed the earth for thy sake, yet have I withdrawn thee from the operation of the curse. As for the serpent, I have fettered his legs and his belly, and I have given him the dust of the earth for food. And Eve have I bound under the yoke of servitude, Inasmuch as thou hast transgressed my commandments, get thee forth, but be not sad. After the fulfillment of the times which I have allotted that, that you shall be in exile outside paradise, in the land which is under the curse, behold, I will send my son, and he shall go down from heaven for thy redemption, and he shall sojourn in a virgin, and shall put on a body of flesh, and through him redemption and a return shall be effected for thee. But command thy sons, and order them to embalm thy body after thy death with myrrh, cassia, and stockte. And they shall place thee in this cave, wherein I am making you to dwell this day, until the time when your expulsion shall take place from the regions of paradise to that earth which is outside it. And whosoever shall be left in those days shall take thy body with him, and shall deposit it on the spot which I shall sow him, in the center of the earth. For in that place shall redemption be effected for thee, and for all thy children. And God revealed unto Adam everything which the son would suffer on behalf of him. Plate 2. The baked clay cylinder inscribed with an account of the capture of Babylon by Cyrus, Kura Ash, the king of Persia, 538 BC. He restored to their original shrines throughout the country the images of the gods which a former king Nabonidus had elected in Babylon and gave the Jews permission to rebuild their temple. Adam's Expulsion from Paradise And when Adam and Eve had gone forth from paradise, 
the door of paradise was shut, and a cherub bearing a two-edged sword stood by it. According to the Book of the Bee, the cherub, or as some think, a terrible form endowed with a body, was armed with a spear and sword, each being made of fire. And Adam and Eve went down in, of spirit, over the mountains of paradise. And they found a cave in the top of the mountain, and they entered and hid themselves therein. When Adam and Eve left paradise, they no longer had fruit and wine and bread and flesh to live upon, and they subsisted on cooked grain and vegetables and the herbs of the earth, of which they ate sparingly. Moreover, the four-footed beasts and fowl and reptiles rebelled against them, and some of them became enemies and adversaries unto them. Book of the Bee, Chapter 17 Now Adam and Eve were virgins, and Adam wished to know Eve his wife. And Adam took from the skirts of the mountain of paradise gold and myrrh and frankincense, and he placed them in the cave. And he blessed the cave and consecrated it, that it might be the house of prayer for himself and his sons. And he called the cave Mi'arath Gaz, i.e. the cave of treasures. So Adam and Eve went down from that holy mountain of Eden to the slopes which were below it. And there Adam knew Eve his wife. A marginal note in the manuscript says that Adam knew Eve thirty years after they went forth from paradise, and Eve conceived and brought forth Cain and Lubudah, his sister, with him. And Eve conceived again, and she brought forth Habil, Abel, and Kelimoth, his sister, with him. The Book of the Bee makes Kelimoth the twin sister of Cain, and Lebudah the twin sister of Abel. And when the children grew up, Adam said unto Eve, Let Cain take to wife Kelimoth, who was brought forth with Abel, and let Abel take to wife Labuda, who was brought forth with Cain. And Cain said unto Eve his mother, I will take to wife my twin sister Labuda, and let Abel take to wife his twin sister Kelimoth. Now Labuda was beautiful. When Adam heard these words, which were exceedingly displeasing unto him, he said, It will be a transgression of the commandment for thee to take to wife thy sister who was born with thee. Nevertheless, take ye to yourselves fruits of trees and the young of sheep, and get ye up to the top of this holy mountain. Then go ye into the cave of treasures, and offer ye up your offerings, and make your prayers, and then ye shall consort with your wives. And it came to pass that when Adam, the first priest, and Cain and Abel his sons, were going up to the top of the mountain, Satan entered into Cain, and persuaded him to kill Abel, his brother, because of Labuda, and because his offering was rejected and was not accepted before God, whilst the offering of Abel was accepted. Cain's jealousy of his brother Abel was increased. And when they came down to the plain, Cain rose up against his brother Abel, and he killed him with a blow from a stone of flint. Then straightway Cain received the doom of death, instead of curses, and he became a fugitive and a wanderer all the days of his life. And God drove him forth into exile in a certain part of the forest of Nod, or Nod. And Cain took to wife his twin sister and made the place of his abode there. Notes. Adam carried Abel to the cave of treasures and buried him therein. And he set by the side of the body a lamp which burned day and night. Abel was fifteen and a half years old when Cain, who was seventeen and a half years old, murdered him. Adam and Eve mourned for Abel, in great grief for one hundred and forty days. Book of Adam and Eve The Birth of Seth And Adam and Eve mourned for Abel one hundred years, and then Adam knew his wife again, and she brought forth Seth, the beautiful, a man mighty and perfect like unto Adam. And he became the father of the mighty men who lived before the flood. Notes, Seth was born in the 130th year of Adam's life, but the book of the bee says it was the 230th year. Adam and Seth and his sons dwelt on the top of Mount Eden, while Cain and his children lived on the plain below. The Posterity of Seth And to Seth was born Anosh, Enos, and Anosh begot Canaan, Canaan and Canaan begot Mahalal, Mahalil. And these are the patriarchs who were born in the days of Adam, the death of Adam. And when Adam had lived 930 years, that is to say, until the 135th year of Mahalal, the day of his death drew nigh and came. 
And Seth, his son, and Anosh, and Canaan, and Mahalal, gathered themselves together and came to him. And they were blessed by him, and he prayed over them. And he commanded his son Seth, and said unto him, Observe my son Seth, that which I, that which I command thee this day. And do thou on the day of thy death give my command to Anosh, and repeat it to him. And let him repeat it to Canaan, and Canaan shall repeat it to Mahala. And let this my command be handed on to all your generations. And when I die, embalm me with myrrh, and cassia, and stock tea, and deposit my body in the cave of treasures. And whosoever shall be left of your generations in that day, when you are going forth from this country which is round about paradise, shall take place, shall carry my body with him, and shall take it and deposit it in the center of the earth. For in that place shall redemption be effected for me and for all my children. And be thou, O my son Seth, governor of the sons of thy people, and thou shalt rule them purely and holily in, in the fear of God. And keep ye your offspring separate from the offspring of Cain the murderer. And when the report Adam is dying was known generally, all his offspring gathered together and came to him. That is to say, Seth, his son, and Anosh, and Canaan, and Malalal, they and their wives, and their sons and their daughters, and Adam blessed them. And the departure of Adam from this world took place in the 930th year, according to the reckoning from the beginning, on the 14th day of the moon, on the 6th day of the month of Nisan, April, at the ninth hour, on the day of the eve of the Sabbath, i.e. the Friday. At the same hour in which the Son of Man delivered up his soul to his Father on the cross, did our father Adam deliver up his soul to him that fashioned him. And he departed from this world. And when Adam was dead, his son Seth embalmed him, according as Adam had commanded him, with myrrh and cassia and stockti. Now Adam's dead body was the first body buried in the earth, and grief for him was exceedingly sore. And Seth and his sons mourned for his death 140 days. And they took Adam's body up to the top of the mountain and buried it in the cave of treasures. And after the families and peoples of the children of Seth had buried Adam, they separated themselves from the children of Cain the murderer. And Seth took Anosh, his firstborn, and Canaan and Malalal and their wives and children and led them up into the glorious mountain where Adam was buried. And Cain and all his descendants remain below on the plain where Cain slew Abel. So remember that as they're going up to this glorious mountain, that I think that that's the mountain at the pole. That's paradise is on the top of that mountain. And the earth surrounds it and it's in the middle of the plain. In the middle of the earth. We're in the center of the earth. The rule of Seth. And Seth became the governor of the children of his people, and he ruled them in purity and holiness. And because of their purity, they received the name, which is the best of all names, and were called the sons of God. They and their wives and their sons. Thus they lived in that mountain, in all purity and holiness, and in the fear of God. And they went up on the skirts of the mountain of paradise, and they became praisers and glorifiers of God in the place of that host of devils who fell from heaven. There they dwelt in peace and happiness. There was nothing about which they needed to feel anxiety. They had nothing to weary or trouble them, and they had nothing to do except to praise and glorify God with the angels. For they heard continually the voices of the angels who were singing praises in paradise which was situated at no great height above them. In fact, only about thirty spans, according to the measure of the Spirit. So as I was saying there, that it's because they're at the North Pole and they're on Mount Meru, or just below Mount Meru, and just above them, at Mount Meru and above it, is paradise. Um, And that's also why the warm weather is there, is the warm, sweet smells drift down from heaven. There's some text in the other uh, book of uh, Atam and Ua where they talk about the cave of treasures and that's what he talks about is that where he placed Adam was uh, done on purpose so that Adam wouldn't continually smell and hear and see the sense of of uh, heaven and it would tempt him and make him sad that he wasn't there anymore 
For they heard continually their voices of the angels who were singing praises in paradise, which was situated at no great height above them, in fact only about thirty spans according to the measure of the Spirit. And they suffered neither toil nor fatigue. They had neither seed nor time nor harvest. But they fed themselves with the delectable fruits of glorious trees of all kinds. And they enjoyed the sweet scent and perfume of the breezes which were wafted forth to them from paradise. Thus lived those holy men, who were indeed holy, and their wives were pure, and their sons were virtuous, and their daughters were chaste and undefiled. In them there was no rebellious thought, no envy, no anger, no enmity. In their wives and daughters there was no impure longing. Neither lasciviousness, nor cursing, nor lying was heard among them. The only oath which they used in swearing was, by the blood of Abel. And they and their wives and their children used to rise up early in the morning, and go up to the top of that holy mountain and worship there before God. And they were blessed by the body of Adam, their father, and they lifted up their eyes to paradise and praised God. And thus they did all the days of their life. So as we were saying, as we were saying there, um, it's funny that I, this is not the part that I was reading that talked about that. So it's funny that came up next about the, the smells wafting down from heaven. So if you haven't heard that piece yet, go and listen to Zen Garcia's uh, Atam and Ua, the book of Adam and Eve, or the book of Atam and Ua, at Zen Garcia at Endeavor Freedom, because he has some amazing readings there. And they were blessed by the body of Adam, and thus they did all the days of their lives. Notes according to the book of the Bee, chapter eighteen. Adam lived 930 years, and Seth lived 913 or 905 years. Seth was 250 years old, 105 years in Genesis uh, chapter 6, when he begot Enos. In the days of Seth, the knowledge of books went forth in the earth, but the church does not accept this. According to the book of Adam 2.5, Seth knew good and evil when he was seven years of age, and he spent his days and nights in fasting and prayer, and he made an offering to God daily. Satan appeared to him and tried to persuade him to leave the holy mountain. Satan appeared to him and tried to persuade him to leave the holy mountain, and to go and live with him, and to marry one of his women. But Seth resisted him, and mounting the altar of God, drove him away. When Seth was fifteen years old, Adam married him to Aklia, the sister of Abel. And when he was twenty years old, he begot Enos. And when Seth had lived one nine hundred and thirteen years, he became sick unto death. And Anosh, his son, and Canaan, and Machlalel, and Jared, or Jared, and Henoch, Enoch, and their wives and their sons gathered together and came unto him, and they were blessed by him. And he prayed over them, and commanded them, and made them to take an oath, and said unto them, I will make you to take an oath, and to swear by the holy blood of Abel, that none of you will go down from this holy mountain to the children of Cain the murderer. For ye know well the enmity which hath existed between us and Cain from the day whereon he slew Abel. And Seth blessed Anosh his son, and gave him commands concerning the body of Adam, and he made him ruler over the children of his people. And Seth ruled them in purity and in holiness, and he ministered diligently before the body of Adam. And Seth died when he was nine hundred and twelve years old. And on the seven and twentieth day of the blessed month of Ab, or August, on the second day of the week, the Monday, at the third hour, in the twentieth year of the life of Enoch, and Anosh, Seth's firstborn son, embalmed his body and buried him in the cave of treasures with his father Adam. And they made a mourning for him forty days. Notes the book of Adam 2.12 says that Seth was embalmed with sweet spices and laid on the right side of Adam's body. But there, but there is no evidence that the Hebrews were acquainted with the art of mummification before they had intercourse with Egypt. The rule of Anosh. And Anosh rose up to minister before God in the cave of treasures, and he became the governor of the children of his people. And he kept all the commandments which his father Seth had commanded him. And he urged them to be constant in prayer. 
Notes According to the Book of the Bee, Chapter 18, Enosh was 299 years in Genesis chapter 9, or Genesis verse 9. So Enosh was 299 years old when he begot Canaan, and Enosh first called upon the name of the Lord. Some say that he first composed books upon the course of the stars and the signs of the zodiac. And in the days of Enosh, in his 820th year, Lamech, the blind man, killed Cain, the murderer, in the forest of Nod. Now this killing took place in the following manner. As Lamech was leaning on his youth, his son Tubal Cain, and the youth was setting straight his father's arm in the direction in which he saw the quarry, he heard the sound of Cain moving about backwards and forwards in the forest. Now Cain was unable to stand still in one place and to hold his peace. And Lamech, thinking that it was a wild beast that was making a movement in the forest, raised his arm and having made ready, drew his bow and shot an arrow towards that spot. And the arrow smote Cain between his eyes and he fell down and died. And Lamech, thinking that he had shot game, spake to the youth saying, Make haste and let us see what game we have shot. And when they went to the spot, and the boy on whom Lamech leaned had looked, he said unto him, O oh my lord, thou hast killed Cain. And Lamech moved his hands to smite them together, and as he did so, he smote the youth and killed him also. Notes the book of Adam 2.13 says that Lamech was armed with a bow and large arrows and a sling and smooth stones. An arrow pierced one side of Cain, and a stone from Lamech's sling knocked out both his eyes. Lamech smote the youth who led him about accidentally, but afterwards he smashed his head in with a stone. There are many versions of the story in Arabic, Ethiopic, and Hebrew, but they all agree in essential details. According to the Book of the Bee, Chapter 18, the anvil and hammer and tongs were invented by Tubal Cain and Jubal. Who also constructed musical instruments, harps and pipes. Devils lived in the pipes and sang therein. And when Anosh had lived 905 years and was sick unto death, all the patriarchs gathered themselves together and came unto him, viz. Canaan, his firstborn son, and Malalel, and Jared, and Enoch, and Matushla, or Methuselah, they and their wives and their sons. And they were blessed by him, and he prayed over them, and commanded them, and spake unto them, saying, I will make you to swear by the holy blood of Abel that not one of you shall go down from this mountain to the plain, nor into the encampment of the children of Cain, the murderer, and ye shall not mingle yourselves among them. Take ye good heed unto this matter, for ye well know what enmity hath existed between us and them from the day whereon Cain slew Abel. And he blessed Cain and his son, and commanded him concerning the body of Adam, that he should minister before it all the days of his life, and that he should rule over the children of his people in purity and holiness. And Enosh died at the age of 905 years on the third day of the month of the first Tishrin, October, on the day of the Sabbath, in the 53rd year of the life of Methuselah. And Canaan, his firstborn, embalmed him and buried him in the cave of treasures, with Adam and Seth his father. And they made a mourning for him forty days. Notes the book of Adam, 2.14, says that Enosh was 985 years old when he died and that he was laid on the left-hand side of Adam in the Cave of Treasures. Plate 3. General view of the ziggurat and the excavations at Ur of the Chaldees. The rule of Canaan. And Canaan stood up before God to minister in the Cave of Treasures. He was an honorable and pure man, and he governed the children of his people in the complete fear of God. And he fulfilled all the commandments of Anosh his father. And when Canaan had lived 920 years, in the book of Adam and the book of the bee 910 years, and was sick unto death. All the patriarchs gathered together and came unto him, viz. Malalel his son and Yared, and Enoch and Methuselah and Lamech. They and their wives and their children, and were blessed by him. 
And he prayed over them and commanded them, saying, I will make you swear by the holy blood of Abel, that none of you shall go down from this holy mountain into the camp of the children of Cain, the murderer, for you all need for you all know well what enmity hath existed between us and them since the day whereon he killed Abel. And he blessed his son Malalel, and admonished him concerning the body of Adam, and said unto him, Behold, O my son Mahlalel, minister thou before God in purity and holiness, in the cave of treasures, and depart not thou from the presence of the body of Adam all the days of thy life. And be thou the governor of the children of thy people, and rule thou them purely and holily. Canaan died, being nine hundred and twenty years old, on the thirty on the thirteenth day of the month of Hezeron, June, on the fourth day of the week, Wednesday, at midday, in the five and sixtieth year of the life of Lamech, the father of Noah. And Malalel his son embalmed him, and buried him in the cave of treasures. And they made mourning for him forty days. Notes according to Genesis verse 12, Canaan was 70 years old when he begot Malalel, but the book of the bee gives 140 years. The book of Adam says that the people made offerings for him after the custom of their fathers, a statement that seems to suggest that the Hebrews not only mummified their dead, but presented funerary offerings to them after the manner of the Egyptians. The rule of Mahlalel. And Mahlalel rose up and ministered before God in the place of Canaan his father. He was in constant prayer by day and by night, and he urged earnestly the children of his people to observe holiness and purity, and to pray without ceasing. And when Mahlalel had lived 895 years, and the day of his departure drew nigh, and he was sick unto death, all the patriarchs gathered together and came unto him, viz. Jared his firstborn, and Enoch, and Methuselah, and Lamech, and Noah, they and their wives and their children, and they were blessed by him. And he prayed over them and commanded them, saying, I will make you to swear by the holy blood of Abel that not one of you shall go down from this holy mountain, and he shall not permit any one of your descendants to go down to the plain to the children of Cain, the murderer. For ye all know well what enmity hath existed between us and them from the day whereupon he slew Abel. And he blessed Jared his firstborn, and he commanded him concerning the body of Adam, and revealed unto him the place whereto he should make ready to go. And he also commanded him, and made him to swear an oath, saying, Thou shalt not depart from the body of our father, Adam, all the days of thy life. And thou shalt be the governor of the children of thy people, and shalt rule them in chastity and holiness. And Malalel died, being eight hundred and ninety-five years old, on the second day of the month Nisan, April, on the first day of the week, Sunday, at the third hour of the day in the four and thirtieth year of the life of Noah. And Jared, his firstborn, embalmed him and buried him in the cave of treasures. And the people made a mourning for him forty days. Notes, according to Genesis verse 15, Malalel was sixty-five years old when he begot Jared. But the book of the bee gives one hundred sixty-five years. The book of Adam, 2.16, says he fell sick when he was eight hundred seventy years old. The latter work makes the patriarch tell Jared that the people will go down from the mountain and mingle with the children of Cain and perish with them the rule of Jared. And Jared his son rose up and ministered before God in the cave of treasures. He was a perfect man and was complete in all the virtues, and he was constant in prayer by day and by night. And because of the excellence of his life and conversation, his days were longer than those of all the children of his people. And in the days of Jared, in the five hundred, in the five hundredth year of his life, the children of Seth broke the oaths which their fathers had made them to swear. And they began to go down from that holy mountain to the encampment of iniquity of the children of Cain, the murderer. And in this way the fall of the children of Seth took place. Notes the book of Adam 2.17 says that Jared continued to govern the people successfully until the end of the 485th year of his life. At this time Satan and thirty of his devils appeared to Jared in the form of handsome men and called him from the cave of treasures. He came out to them and thought they were strangers and asked them who they were. In answer, Satan told him that he was Adam and that among his companions were Abel, Seth, Enos, Canaan, and other kinsmen of Jared. He invited Jared to come with him and live with him in the garden which God had given him. And at length, Jared was persuaded to leave the cave and go with him. When they arrived at the top of the mountain of the sons of Cain, Satan pretended that he 
pretended that he had left a garment for Jared by the cave and sent one of his devils back to fetch it, telling him at the same time to extinguish the lamp which was burning in the cave near Adam's body. Satan and Jared rested by a fountain and food was brought out to them by the sons and daughters of Cain, but Jared refused to eat or drink. Satan entreated him to put aside his sadness and to do as he was going to do. Thereupon Satan and five of his devils each seized a woman and committed fornication with her. And on seeing this exhibition of iniquity, Jared burst into tears and began to pray to God to be delivered from that place. When he began to pray, the devils took to flight and God sent an angel who brought him back to his holy mountain. When he returned to the cave, his people told him that the lamp had been extinguished and that the bodies of the patriarchs had been scattered about and that voices had come from them. On entering the cave, a voice came to him from Adam's body and warned him to beware of Satan and his wiles and told him to relight the lamp from the fire on the altar at which Adam had ministered. The lamp was relighted at the end of the 450th year of Jared's life. Eighty years later, his people began to go down to the children of Cain and to mingle with their women. And in the fortieth year of Jared, the first thousand years from Adam to Jared came to an end. And in these years, the handicraftsmen of sin and the disciples of Satan appeared, for he was their teacher, and he entered in and dwelt in them, and he poured into them the spirit of the operation of error through which the fall of the children of Seth was to take place. That is the first thousand years. The second thousand years. Jared to the flood. Of the transmission of the art of playing the harp. That is to say of music and singing and dancing. Jubal and Tubalcain, the two brethren, the sons of Lamech, the blind man who killed Cain, invented and made all kinds of instruments of music. Jubal made reed instruments and harps and flutes and whistles and the devils went and dwelt inside them. When men blew into the pipes, the devils sang inside them and sent out sounds from inside them. Tubalcain made cymbals and sistra and tambourines or drums. And lasciviousness and fornication increased among the children of Cain, and they had nothing to occupy them except fornication. Now they had no obligation to pay tribute, and they had neither prince nor governor, and eating and drinking and lasciviousness and drunkenness and dancing and singing to instruments of music and the wanton sportings of the devils and the laughter which affordeth pleasure to the devils and the sounds of the furious lust of men neighing after women. And Satan, finding his opportunity in this work of error, rejoiced greatly, because thereby he could compel the sons of Seth to come down from that holy mountain. There they had been made to occupy the place of that army of angels that fell with Satan. There they were beloved by God. There they were held in honor by the angels and were called sons of God. Even as the blessed David saith in the psalm, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you sons of the Most High. Psalm LXXXII 6 Meanwhile, fornication reigned among the daughters of Cain. And without shame, several women would run after one man and one man would attack another, and they committed fornication in the presence of each other shamelessly. For all the devils were gathered together in that camp of Cain, and unclean spirits entered into the women and took possession of them. The old women were more lascivious than the maidens. Fathers and sons defiled themselves with their mothers and sisters. Sons respected not even their own fathers, and fathers made no distinction between their sons and other men. And Satan had been made ruler or prince of that camp, and when the men and women were stirred up to lascivious frenzy by the devilish playing of the reeds which emitted, which emitted musical sounds, and by the harps which the men played through the operation of the power of the devils, and by the sounds of the tambourines and of the sistra, which were beaten and rattled through the agency of evil spirits, the sounds of their laughter were heard in the air above them, and ascended to that holy mountain. And when the children of Seth heard the noise and uproar and shouts of laughter in the camp of the children of Cain, about one hundred of them who were mighty men of war gathered together and set their faces to go down to the camp of the children of Cain. When Jared heard their words and knew their intention, he became sorely afflicted. And he sent and called them to him and said unto them, By the holy blood of Abel, I will have you swear that not one of you shall go down from this holy mountain. Remember ye the oaths which our fathers Seth and Anosh and Canaan 
and Malalel made you to swear. And Enoch also said unto them, Hearken, O ye children of Seth, no man who shall transgress the commandment of Jared, and break the oaths of our fathers, and go down from this mountain, shall never again ascend it. But the children of Seth would neither hearken to the commandment of Jared, nor to the words of Enoch, and they dared to transgress the commandment. And those hundred men, who were mighty men of war, went down to the camp of Cain. And when they saw that the daughters of Cain were beautiful in form, and that they were naked and unashamed, the children of Seth became inflamed with the fire of lust. And when the daughters of Cain saw the goodliness of the children of Seth, they gripped them like ravening beasts and defiled their bodies. And the children of Seth slew their souls by fornication with the daughters of Cain. And when the children of Seth wished to go up again to that holy mountain, after they had come down and fallen, the stones of that holy mountain became fire in their sight. And having defiled their souls with the fire of fornication, God did not permit them to ascend to that holy place. And moreover, very many others made bold and went down after them, and they too fell. Notes This story is told at great length in the book of Adam, 2.20. Satan appeared in the form of one Gunun and taught him to make horns and trumpets, stringed instruments, cymbals, psalteries, lyres, harps, and flutes. Into these Satan himself entered and made the music which came from them. Gunun made corn spirit and established drinking booths in which men assembled and drank and ate fruit. Then Satan taught Gunun to make weapons of war out of iron and when men were drunk they killed each other with them. Next Satan taught men how to dye their garments crimson and purple, and they arrayed themselves in gaudy attire and began to race their horses. Little by little the children of Seth began to wish to join the sons of Cain. And when the devils had shown them a way down the mountain, one hundred of them went down to the plain and were led astray by the women whose hands and feet were stained with bright dyes and whose faces had tattoo marks on them. When the Sethites tried to return to the top of the mountain, the stones turned into coals of fire, and they could not pass over them. Company after company of the children of Seth went down to the plain, and at length only Yared and a few others remained on the mountain. The Ethiopic Book of Enoch supplies interesting details about the fall of the children of Seth. The leaders of those who went down from Ardis on Mount Hermon, where Samyaza, the commander-in-chief, Urakibara, Ramael, Kokabil, Tamail, Ramuel, Danel, Zakilo, Sarakuyal, Asael, Armaros, Batral, Anani, Zakeba, Samsawi, Sawel, Sartael, Turael, Yomyael, and Azaziel. Each of these was over a company of ten. The names of two of the Decarchs of the two hundred angels are omitted. These angels took to themselves wives, and taught them the use of spells and enchantments, and the use of plants and trees for medicinal purposes. The daughters of Cain conceived, and a tradition in the Kebra Nagast says that the children were so large that they could not be born in the ordinary way, but had to be removed from their mothers by the umbilicus, or by a caesarean section. These children grew up and became giants 3,000 cubits in height. And when they had devoured all the provisions which their neighbors had elected, they began to fight against men and to eat them, and at length they ate the flesh and drank the blood of each other. Concerning these giants, the book of Enoch, chapter 15, says, Now the giants who were produced from the spirits and the flesh shall be called evil spirits on earth, and their habitation shall be on the earth. Evil spirits shall proceed from their bodies, and the spirits of the giants shall consume and persecute and lay waste, and fight and work destruction on the earth and afflict men. They shall neither eat food of any kind, nor suffer thirst, and they shall remain invisible. And these, and these spirits shall attack the children of men and women, for from them have they come forth. The wickedness of these giants became so great that the earth complained to God, at this time, Azazel taught men the art of working in metals and the use of stibium or eye paint and the art of dyeing stuffs in bright colors. Amazarach taught enchantments, i.e. magic, and the knowledge of herbs. Armaros taught how spells were to be broken. 
Orakal taught astrology and Kokabel taught the knowledge of science. Tamel taught astronomy and Azradel taught concerning the moon. Book of Enoch chapter 8 chapter 9 the originals of these seven sages were probably the seven wise men who were revered by the Babylonians. Interesting. Did you catch that? So the seven sages were the seven wise men. And really that was the seven devils. And when Jared had lived 960 years, and the day of his departure approached, and came nigh and arrived, all the patriarchs gathered themselves together and came unto him. Viz Enoch his firstborn, and Methuselah, and Lamech, and Noah, they and their wives and their children, and were blessed by him. And he prayed over them and said unto them, I will make you to swear by the holy blood of Abel that you will not go down from this holy mountain. For I know that God will not allow you to remain very much longer in this holy country. Inasmuch as ye have transgressed the commandment of your fathers, ye shall surely be cast out into that outer country and ye shall no longer have your habitation on the skirts of the mountain of paradise. And take ye good heed to this. Let him that is among you who shall go forth from that holy country take with him the body of our father Adam, and the offerings of gold, frankincense, and myrrh that are in the cave of treasures, and let him carry away and deposit the body in the place wherein he shall be commanded by God to set it down. And thou, my son Enoch, depart thou not from before the body of Adam, but minister before God purely and holily all the days of thy life. And Jared died, being 962 years old, on the thirteenth day of the month of Iyar, May, on the day of the eve of the Sabbath, Friday, at sunset, in the, in the 366th year of the life of Noah. And Enoch his son embalmed him and buried him in the cave of treasures, and they made mourning for him forty days. Notes, the book of the bees says that Yared was 962 years old when he died. The Rule of Enoch And Enoch stood up to minister before God in the cave of treasures. And the children of Seth turned aside from the right path and willed to go down to the children of Cain on the plain. And Enoch and Methuselah and Lamech and Noah mourned over them. And Enoch had ministered before God for fifty years in the three hundred and sixty-fifth year of the life of Noah. And when Enoch knew that God was about to remove him from the earth, he called Methuselah and Lamech and Noah and said unto them, I know that God is wroth with this generation, and that a pitiless judgment hath been decreed for the people thereof. Ye are the chiefs of this generation, and the remnant thereof. For no other man shall be born on this mountain who shall be the chief of the children of his people. But take ye good heed to yourselves, and see that ye minister before God in purity and holiness. And when Enoch had given them his commandment in these words, God removed him to the land of life, and to the delectable mansions which are round about paradise, and to that country which is beyond the reach of death. And of all the children of Seth there remained only these three patriarchs in the mountain of the triumphant ones viz. Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah, for all the others had betaken themselves to the encampment of the sons of Cain. Notes. Then Michael, Gabriel, Cyril, and Uriel looked down from heaven and saw the wickedness which Azazel had done in the world. And they heard the appeal which the souls of the dead were making to heaven. And they reported the matter to the Most High. When God heard their words, he sent the angel Arsialior, or the, to the son of Lamech, i.e. Noah, with the command, Hide thyself. No mention is made of Methuselah, who begot Lamech when he was 187 years old, and who lived 969 years, and Lamech, who lived 777 years, and begot Noah, in the 182nd year of his age, was passed over in favor of his son. Noah consolidated his position by marrying the daughter of Enoch, the angel revealed to Noah that a flood was about to cover the earth, and told him how to escape from it. Then God commanded Raphael to bind Azazel hand and foot, and to thrust him into a dark hole in the desert of Dudael, a place near Jerusalem, and heap stones and rocks upon him. There he was to remain until the day of judgment, when he would be cast into the fire and consumed. Gabriel was sent to destroy all the children of fornication, 
and Michael was sent to bind Samyaza and the other Dekarks of the children of Seth, and to imprison them under the mountains of the earth for seventy generations, after which time they were to be taken to the abyss of fire and tortured there forever. Book of Enoch, Chapter 10 The Book of the Mysteries of Heaven and Earth by Abba Bakyala Mikhail Ed Parakon says that it was the men who taught men the arts of civilization who caused God to bring the flood on the earth. This work gives the names of these men and describes their inventions. Thus, Papyrus understood the sun, Rurid quarried stones, Zarel instituted the month, Pinene introduced horse riding or racing, Gale invented the axe, Tigana invented the shield, Horeri taught men to play musical instruments, Yebe taught men working in iron, and Meged taught horse riding. Nagodi discovered medicinal springs and made known the planetary hours when the waters were most effective. Garge made the first corn grinder, and Seder taught men how to mix dough. Gimer taught the use of earthenware vessels for food. Zare taught men to milk animals. Hege taught men to make roofs, and Tentoreb showed them how to make doors. Safer, Safer taught butter making. Halage discovered how to carve wood and stone. Hedair was the first to cultivate trees. Sino taught house building and Toph invented the potter's craft. Ator Begas invented agricultural implements and Sebedegas introduced the use of coal, an eye paint or stibium. Zara invented the brewing of beer while Betanaladas invented the oven. Nafil taught men to make plantations and gardens, while Yarbaid discovered how to fell trees and saw them up. Elio taught dancing. Pinamus invented architecture and writing. Agelamon taught the use of beasts and plowing and how to drive furrows. Cusus invented plows and leather whips. Akor discovered bronze and copper. Certain men taught working in cedar and willow wood. Wasag and Abaregia taught men the game of Tabat, and Nair and Zaberagwed taught them to play the games of Atawama and Akis, the games of the circus. Plate 4 1. The inscribed cone of Ur Namu, which was inserted in the vertical joint of one of his buildings. The Rule of Noah. And when Noah saw that sin had increased in his generation, he preserved himself in virginity for five hundred years. Then God spake unto him and said unto him, Take unto thee wife Hakel, the daughter of Namus, or Hakel Namus, the daughter of Enoch, the brother of Methuselah. And God revealed unto him concerning the flood which he was making ready to produce. And he spake to him and said unto him, One hundred and thirty years from this moment I will make a flood. Plate 4-2, an arched doorway in the northeast wall of the sanctuary of Idublamach of the time of Kuri Galzu, about 1600 BC. Notes, the book of Adam says that Hakel was the daughter of Abaraz, who was one of the children of the family of Enos, who went into perdition. If this be so, Noah married a woman who was akin to the children of Cain. The book of the bee merely states that Noah's wife was the was of the children of Seth. The Building of the Ark And God said unto Noah, Make for thyself an ark for the saving of the children of thy house, and build it in the plain below this mountain, in the encampment of the children of Cain. And ye shall cut down the timber for the same from the trees that are on this mountain, and thus shall be the dimensions thereof. Its length shall be 300 cubits according to thy cubit, its breadth shall be 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits, and above it shall be finished off one cubit. And make three stories in it, the lowermost shall be for wild animals and cattle, the middle one shall be for the birds and feathered fowl, and the topmost shall be for thee and the children of thy house. And make in it cisterns for water and cupboards for food. And make to thyself a striking board of Eshkar, a wood which, would, which will not rot, but three cubits long, and a cubit and a half in breadth. And there shall be a hammer of the same kind of wood, and with it 
thou shalt strike the board three times in the day, once in the morning, so that the workmen may be gathered together for the work of the ark, and once at midday that they may eat food, and once at sunset so that they may cease from their labor. And when thou strikest the board, and men hear the sound of the blows, sayeth un and say unto thee, What is it thou that thou doest? Thou shalt say unto them, God is going to make a flood of waters. And Noah did as commanded him. And there were born unto him three sons within the space of a hundred years, Shem, Ham, and Japhet. And they took unto them wives of the daughters of Methuselah. According to the Book of the Bee, the stories were to have boards and projecting ledges, each board being one cubit long and one span broad. The wood used was either box or teak, and the ark was pitched within and without. The Book of Adam 3.2 says that each story was ten cubits high. The first was for lions and other animals and ostriches, the second was for birds and reptiles, and the third for Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japhet, and their wives. The cisterns were to be lined with lead inside and out. Noah begot his sons during the hundred years in which he was building the ark. During these years he ate no animal food, and he wore the same pair of sandals which did not wear out, and the same apparel and headcloth, and he carried the same staff. His hair neither increased nor diminished. His sons married daughters of Methuselah. The death of Lamech. And when Lamech had lived 770 years, he died during the lifetime of Methuselah, his father, 40 years before the flood, on the 21st day of the month of Elul, September. On the first day of the week, Sunday, in the 68th year of the life of Shem, the firstborn of Noah. And Noah, his firstborn, embalmed him. And Methuselah, his father, swathed him for burial, and they buried him in the cave of treasures, and mourned for him forty days. Notes: The book of Adam says that Lamech was 553 years old when he died, but the book of the bee gives his age as 774 or 777 years. The rule of Methuselah and Noah. And Methuselah and Noah remained alone on the mountain, for all the children of Seth had gone down from the skirts on the mountain of paradise, to the plain where the children of Cain lived. And men, the children of Seth, had intercourse with the daughters of Cain, who conceived of them, and brought forth men, giants, and the sons of giants, who were like unto towers. Now because of this certain ancient writers have fallen into error and have written, the angels came down from heaven and had intercourse with men. And by them these famous giants have been produced, but this is not true. For those who have written in this manner did not understand the facts. Behold, O my brother readers, and ye know ye that it is not in the nature of beings of the spirit to beget, neither is it in the nature of the devils who are unclean beings and workers of wickedness and lovers of adultery to beget, because there are neither males nor females among them. And since the time when the angels fell, not another angel has been added to their number. And if the devils were able to have intercourse with women, they would not leave unravished a single virgin in all the race of the children of men. The death of Methuselah. And when Methuselah had lived 969 years, and the day of his departure had drawn nigh, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japhet and their wives came unto him. Now of all the posterity of Seth who had not betaken themselves down to the plain, only these eight souls were left, viz. Noah, Shem, Ham, Japhet, and their wives, for no children were born to them before the flood. And when these gathered themselves together to Methuselah, and they had been blessed by him, he embraced them and kissed them sorrowfully and wept over the fall of the children of Seth. And he said unto them, Of all the tribes and families of your fathers, this remnant consisting of eight souls alone is left. May the Lord God of our father bless you. The Lord God who formed our father Adam and Eve by themselves, and they were fruitful and multiplied, and the whole of the blessed land which was round about paradise was filled with their progeny. It shall make you to be fruitful and to multiply, and the whole earth shall be filled with you. He shall save you from the terrible wrath which, had, which hath been decreed against this rebellious generation, and he shall be with you, and he shall protect you, and the gift which was given by God unto our father Adam shall go forth with you from this holy country. 
And these three measures of the wheat of blessings which God gave unto your father Adam shall serve as leaven, and shall be kneaded into your seed, and into the seed of your children. That is to say, royalty, priesthood, and prophecy. Hearken thou, Noah, thou blessed of the Lord. Behold, I am going forth from this world like all my fathers, but thou and thy children shall be saved. And thou shalt do everything which I am commanding you to this day. And thou shalt do everything which I am commanding you to do this day, for God will make the flood. When I die, embalm my body, and bury me in the cave of treasures with my fathers. Take thy wife and thy sons, and the wives of thy sons, and get thee down from this holy mountain. And take with thee the body of our father Adam, and these three offerings, gold and myrrh and frankincense. Set the body of Adam in the middle of the ark, and lay these offerings upon him. Thou and thy sons shall occupy the eastern part of the ark, and thy wife and thy sons' wives shall occupy the western part thereof. Thy wives shall not pass over you, thy wives shall not pass over to you, and ye shall not pass over to them. Ye shall neither eat nor drink with them, and ye shall have no intercourse whatsoever with them until ye go forth from the ark. Now this generation hath provoked God to wrath, and he will neither permit them to be neighbors of those who are in paradise, nor to praise him with the angels. And when the waters of the flood have subsided from the face of the earth, and ye go forth from the ark, and ye take up your abode in that land, thou, O Noah, the blessed of the Lord, shalt not depart from the ark, from the body of our father Adam, but minister thou before God in the ark purely and holily all the days of thy life. And these offerings shall be placed in the east, and command thou, Shem, thy firstborn, to take up with him after thy death the body of our father Adam, and to carry it and deposit it in the middle of the earth. And let him establish there a man from among his descendants who shall minister there. And he shall be one who is set apart, Nazira, all the days of his life. He shall not take a wife, he shall not shed blood, and he shall not offer up these offerings of wild animals and feathered fowl, but he shall offer unto God bread and wine. For by these redemption shall be made for Adam and all his posterity. And the angel of God shall go before him, and he shall show him the place where the middle of the earth is situated. And the apparel of him that shall stand up there to minister before the body of Adam shall be the skins of wild animals. He shall not shave off the hair of his head, and he shall not cut his nails, but he shall remain alone in the in his natural state, because he is the priest of God the Most High. Notes According to the Book of Adam 4 or 5, Shem was to appoint Melchizedek, see Genesis, uh, Genesis 14, 18 through 24, and Hebrews chapter 7. The son of Canaan, according to the book of Adam, Shem was to appoint Melchizedek, the son of Canaan, and grandson of Arphaxad, to be the priest of the Most High, and he was to stand and minister on the mountain which is in the middle of the earth. He was to wear a garment of skin, and have a leather girdle about his loins, and his apparel was to be humble and without ornament. And when Methuselah had commanded Noah to do all these things, he died with tears in his eyes and sorrow in his heart. He was 969 years old when he died on the 14th day of the month Adar, March, on the first day of the week, Sunday, in the 79th year of the life of Shem, the son of Noah. And Noah, his grandson, embalmed the body of Methuselah with myrrh and cassia and stockteen. And Noah and his sons buried him in the cave of treasures, and they and their wives made mourning for him forty days. And when the days of his mourning had passed, Noah went into the cave of treasures, and embraced and kissed the holy bodies of Seth and Anosh and Canaan and Malalel and Jared and Methuselah and Lamech his father. And he was greatly moved and tears gushed from his eyes. And Noah carried the body of our father Adam and the body of Eve and his firstborn Shem carried the gold and Ham carried the myrrh and Japhet the frankincense. And they went forth from the cave of treasures. The book of Adam does not mention Eve.
And as they were coming down from that holy mountain, they were smitten sorely with grief, and they wept in agony because they were to be deprived of that holy place and the habitation of their fathers. And weeping painfully and wailing sorrowfully and enveloped in gloom, they said, Remain in peace, O holy paradise, thou habitation of our father Adam. He went forth from thee alive, but stripped of glory and naked, and behold, at his death he was deprived of thy nearness. He and his progeny were cast out into exile in that land of curses, to pass their days there in pain, in sicknesses, and in labor, and in weariness, and in trouble. Remain in peace, O cave of treasures, remain in peace, O habitation and inheritance of our fathers, remain ye in peace. O our fathers and patriarchs, pray ye for us, O ye who have lived in the dust, Ye friends and beloved ones of the living God, pray ye for the remnant of your posterity which is left. O ye who have propitiated God, make supplication unto him on our behalf in your prayers. Remain in peace, O Anosh, remain ye in peace, O ye ministers of God, Canaan and Malalal and Jared and Methuselah and Lamech and Enoch, cry out in sorrow on our behalf. Remain in peace, O haven and asylum of the angels. O ye, our fathers, cry out in sorrow on our behalf, because ye will be deprived of our society. And we will cry out in sorrow, because we are cast out into a bare land, for our habitation will be with the wild beasts. And as they were coming down from that holy mountain, they kissed the stones thereof and embraced the delectable trees thereof. And in this wise they came down, and they wept with great sorrow, and shed scalding or bitter tears, and suffering sorely they descended to the plain. And Noah went into the ark and deposited the body of Adam in the middle thereof, and he placed these offerings upon it. Now in the year wherein Noah went into the ark, the second thousand years of the posterity of Adam to the time of the flood came to an end, according to what the seventy wise writers have told us. Notes the book of Adam 3.6 says that when Noah and his sons were carrying the bottom body of Adam out of the cave, the bodies of the other patriarchs cried out and asked the body of Adam if they were to be separated from it. Adam replied that he must leave the holy mountain and told them that he knew God would bring their bodies together again on another occasion and bade them to wait patiently. Adam asked God to allow the lighted lamp to remain with the bodies in the cave until the resurrection. This God did, and then he closed the cave until the day of the resurrection. Noah and his sons marveled greatly when they heard the bodies of the patriarchs talking together in the cave. Having carried away the body of Adam and the gold, myrrh and frankincense, they returned to the mountain, intending to enter the cave once again. They sought carefully but could not find the cave, and then they knew God had sealed in it, and then they knew God had sealed it and had hidden it from them, so that they might never dwell therein again. The Third Thousand Years the third thousand years from the flood to the reign of Ru, or Reu, Noah's entry into the ark. The entrance of Noah into the ark took place on the day of the eve of the Sabbath, Friday, on the seventeenth day of the blessed month of Er, May. On the Friday in the morning, i.e. the third hour, the beasts and the cattle went into the lowermost story, and at midday all the feathered fowl and all the reptiles went into the middle story. And at sunset Noah and his sons went into the ark, on the east side of the third story. And his wife and the wives of his sons went to the west side. And the body of Adam was deposited in the middle of the ark, wherein also all the mysteries of the church were deposited. Thus women in church shall be on the west side, and men on the east side, so that the men may not see the faces of the women, and the women may not see the faces of the men. Thus also was it in the ark, the women were on the west side and the men on the east side, and the body of our father Adam was placed between them, like a raised stand or throne. And as quietness reigneth in the church between men and women, so also peace reigned in the ark between the wild beasts and the feathered fowl and the creeping things or reptiles. And as kings and judges and rich men and poor men and governors and sick men and beggars live in a concord, that is to say in a general bond of peace, so also was it in the ark. For lions and panthers and savage beasts of prey lived in peace and harmony with the cattle, and the beasts that were fierce and strong lived in peace with those that were timid and weak. 
and the lion with the ox, and the wolf with the lamb, and the lion's whelp with the calf, and the serpent with the dove, and the hawk with the sparrow. The Flood And when Noah and his sons had gone into the ark, and his wife and the wives of his sons, on the seventeenth day of the month of Er, May, at sunset, the door of the ark was shut fast, and Noah and his sons in captivity in the darkness. And as soon as the door of the ark was shut, the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and the foundations of the earth were rent asunder, and ocean, that great sea which surroundeth the whole earth, poured forth its floods. And whilst the floodgates of heaven were opened, and the foundations of the earth were rent asunder, the storehouses of the winds burst their bolts, and storm and whirlwind swept forth, and ocean roared and hurled its floods upon the earth. And the children of Seth, who had besmirched themselves in the mire of fornication, ran to the door of the ark and entreated Noah to open them, and entreated Noah to open to them the door of the ark. And when they saw the water floods which were swirling about them and engulfing them on all sides, they were in great tribulation. And they tried to climb up the mountains of paradise, but were unable to do so. Now the ark was closed and sealed, and the angel of the Lord stood over one side of it that he might act as the pilot thereof. And when the floods of waters mastered the children of Seth, and they began to drown in their great and mighty waves, then was fulfilled that which David spake concerning them, saying, I said, Ye are gods, and all of ye, and all of you sons of the Most High. But since ye have done this, and ye have loved the fornication of the daughters of Cain, like them ye shall perish, and even as they did, so shall ye die. Plate 5. The Ruins of the Great Hall of Justice Okay, so we're going to continue, and I'm just going to cut in here with this portion about this amazing book from the fragments of the Kawan. It's Middle Persian. So what this is, is the Book of the Giants. It was, this piece that I'm reading to you was released by the Bulletin of the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London in 1943. The transcriptions of the original text have been omitted. So, Isaac de Beausopre, or Huguenot, author of one of the best books ever written on Manichaeism, the history, the critique of Manichae and Manichaeism, Amsterdam, 1734 to 1739, was the one to make the only sound suggestions on the sources used by Mani for the compilation of his Book of the Giants, the Book of Enoch, and the and then I can't read Greek, but which Kenan, a great grandson of Noah, discovered lying in a field. The latter work has been identified by Alfaric with a book whose contents are briefly indicated in the Decretum Galassianum. So, this is called Liber de Yogia, the book of the ogres, the book of the giants, and the book of Ogia. The Book of Enoch, which is composed in the Hebrew language in the 2nd century, only an Ethiopic version, a few Greek fragments and some experts, excerpts made by the Byzantine chronographer Georgius Sincellus, survive. Mani, who could hardly read the Hebrew, must have used an Arama Aramaic edition. Okay, so the, this is all the history of how they wrote the book, how they gathered these texts. So we won't go into that too far. It's pretty boring, but I'm going to try and cut to the actual text itself. So remember that we're, we're talking about the story of the fallen angels and their giant sons. So this is clearly, this is part of the, the story. Okay, so I'm just going to cut in with, the problem is that this piece is not completely finished as much as the book of Enoch is finished. So and we'll put it all together at the end. So... The Book of Enoch did not square with Mani's convictions that no evil could come from good. Therefore, he had transformed them into demons, namely those demons that when the world was being constructed had been imprisoned in the skies under the supervision of the Rex Honoris, or the King of Honor. They rebelled and were recaptured, but 200 of them escaped to the earth. Mani also used the term 
a pot preserved in Coptic. So the puzzling clause of Genesis 6, 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Was interpreted by Mani in this fashion. When the Egregori descended, the animals, or proto-animals, were already in existence. Many confused Nephilim with Nephal. I don't think he did make any confusion. Where the giants and the abortions are mentioned in one breath. And Manichaean parlance, abortion, is synonymous with animal. So this is interesting, uh, just using the words there, how humans are actually in the official government text. If you look up human or person, it comes up as animal or beast of the field. So it's just an interesting uh, tie-in of how they, they use words against us. We're going to carry on. There's another portion here that I'm going to get into about about the name of God again and how that was actually used and what, what really happened there. So what we know, what I know so far, is that Samyaza knew the name of God or one of those angels knew the name of God and made a deal to give that name to Ishtar and that that is what made Ishtar so powerful and made him or her a god, a little g god. So what happened there, Tabaet, the son of the serpent, or son of serpent, and Kabael taught the oath to the humans. And the oath's name is Pika. They asked Michael to enunciate the name so that they might say it in the oath. And they placed it in Aka'e, in the hand of Michael. The heavens are hung, and the world is hung from the oath. So the oath is God's deal, or God's binding arrangement with the stars, and with the heavens, and with the heavenly appointed angels to conduct their marching orders as as he's laid forth in that deal and it's a contract so it's the contract or the covenant with God and the angels and it's the contract and the covenant to hold up their end of the bargain and hold up the universe as we know it the earth and the clouds and and the heavens and everything the cosmos, the cosmic devices. So, we'll carry on. Back to the book of Ogum, or Ogium. Isn't it interesting that the book of Ogum, and Ogum is a language that's made of scratch marks, basically, uh, bar marks, that is found all over the world and in North America. It's almost as if the giants were on the run and made a run to North America for a while. Uh, before they were all killed off or captured. And you see that what happened when we talked about earlier that God told the angels to bind, he told Gabriel and Michael and Uriel to bind the bad angels, the fallen angels, and he told them to give a sword or weapons to the giants and cause them to have civil war and kill each other. And so that's what this book is about. It's, there's more. They're, not, they're named uh, the Gaborim. is another name for giants. Uh, from the Syriac word Gabare. In Eastern sources, they are mostly referred to as demons. The puzzling clause, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, was possibly misinterpreted. I think that it was not misinterpreted. So, we are therefore left with Gaborim understood as giants. Parth. K.W. Kwa is freely used in Manichaean texts as of the father of light, of solar deities, also of the first man and Arhaman, with reference to the first battle, which therefore could have been described as Arhaman, and it uses a Greek word for it. However, the word Kwa is applied only to men and such beings as are imagined anthropomorphous, where one would translate it has monster, the Iranian equivalent is Mazan. Thus, the Kafalia, whose breathing 
operations are responsible for ebb and flow is called mitzin i rigi in Middle Persian. Accordingly, the related words mazan, mazanig, sogd, mitzni, and others should be rendered as monster or gigantic, monstrous. The Egrigori and their giant progeny are fought and vanquished by four archangels Raphael, Michael, Gabriel, and Israel, Enoch, Tenwan, or Uriel, or Fanuel. In the Book of the Giants, they are called the Four Angels. They are frequently invoked by name in Manichaean prayers. There were no details about individual feats of the giants in the Book of Enoch. Manny filled the gap with the help of the above mentioned Liber de Ogia Nomine Gigante. Uh, so, the book of the ogres named Giants. This Ogias has been identified with Og of Bashan, who, according to late sources, lived 5,000 years and managed to survive the deluge thanks to his giant size. But possibly stories that primarily appertained to Ogias were transferred to the better known Og, owing to the resemblance of their names. The name of Ogias is Y in the Manichaean fragments, and this spelling is presumably more correct than that of Ogias. Og indubitably would appear as Wug, since Mani took Y from an Aramaic text. The ending of Ogius cannot be regarded as a Greek addition. Ogius fought with a Draco, and so did Oya. His enemy was the Leviathan. Oya and his brother Ahya were the sons of Shamas, the chief of the Egregori in the Book of Enoch. So Shem or Shem, uh, different translations of Shamas and and also we know that that is we know what character that is in the persian edition of the kawan ohia and aya are translated as sam and nariman but the original names are kept in one passage the translator did well to choose sam krasasp both with regard to oji longevity sam is one of the immortals and to his fight with the dragon sam is a famous dragon killer in the sogdian fragments the name of san is spelt differently this name may have been invented to keep the names of the brothers resembling each other. Nariman was evidently not known as Sogdiana as a brother of Sam. According to the Book of the Giants, the preoccupation of Sam Sham was his quarrel with the giant Machawe, the son of Virog Dod, who was one of the twenty years of the Egregori. The Book of the Giants was published in not less than six or seven languages. From the original Syriac, the Greek and Middle Persian versions were made. The Sogdian edition was probably derived from the Middle Persian, the Uyghur from the Sogdian. There is no trace of a Parthian text. The book may have existed in Coptic. Fragments of the Kawan, Middle Persian. So remember, we're telling the story of Og and of the giants. A hard arrow bow, he that Sam said, Blessed be, had he seen this, he would not have died. Then Shamazad said to Sam, his son, All that Mahawe has done is spoilt. Thereupon he said, son and sam we are left here until forever and ever like those that are in the fiery hell as my father virogdad was then shamazad says it is true what he says he says one of thousands for one of thousands sam thereupon began and mahawai too in many places until to that place he might escape and something virogdad hobabis robbed ar of noxtag his wife thereupon the giants began to kill each other and to abduct their wives. The creatures too began to kill each other. Sam before the sun, one hand in the air, the other, whatever he obtained to his brother, was imprisoned over Toxtag. So, what he's saying there is that the four angels, in whatever means, however they did it, were able to make Hobabis sleep with Ar's wife. Okay, and it carries on about Mani's understanding of the Gaborim and their understanding of how these texts were moved through the area and and how the words give away where they came from. So I'll read this little bit here. In their journey across Central Asia, the stories of the Book of the Giants were influenced by local traditions. Thus, the translation of Oyah as Sam and its train the introduction of myth appertaining to that Iranian hero. This explains the immortality of Sam, according to text. The country of Aryan Vedan, Aryan Vaya, in text G26, is a similar innovation. The Kogman Mountains, in text Bravo, may reflect the Mount Hermon, 
the progeny of the fallen angels was confined in 36 towns, text Sogdian. Owing to the introduction of the Mount Sumeru, this number was changed in Sogdiana to 32, text G22. The heaven of Indra is situated before the four peaks of the Meru and consists of 32 cities of Devas or Devas. The Atel Handbook of Chinese Buddhism, page 148. Triastrimsat, Fragments of the Koan, A. Middle Persian. Fifteen fragments of a book threw out small pieces from the center of the pages. It has proved impossible so far to reestablish the original order of the pages on purely technical grounds, the size of the fragments, the appearance of the margins, etc. I at first assumed the following sequence. Being unable to estimate the cogency of these technical reasons now, because of the absence of any photographic material, I have decided to change the order of the first six fragments in the following way. And then he changes the order. Unfortunately, we do not know in what order many had told the story of the giants. The task of finding the original order is made still more difficult by the fact that besides the Kawan book contained one or more uh, treatises, namely parables referring to the hearers, and possibly a discourse on the five elements. And the only fragments that undoubtedly belong to the Kawan, while the position of the fragments is particularly doubtful, it must be borne in mind that whole folios may be missing between apparently successive pages. Fragment C. Hard arrow bow he that Sam said, Blessed, had he seen them, he would not have died. Then Shamsai had said to Sam his son, All that Matawai has done is spoiled. And thereupon he said to me, We are stuck here, and and that are in the fiery hell as my father Varogdad was. Shahamazad said, It is true what he says. He says one of thousands for one of thousands. And Sam thereupon began, Mahawai too in many places, until to that place he might escape. And Varogdad Hobablus rogged Ar of Naxtag, his wife. Thereupon the giants began to kill each other and to abduct their wives. The creatures, too, began to kill each other. And Sam, before the sun, one hand in the air, the other pointed towards the ground, perhaps. Whatever he obtained to his brother, again imprisoned, over Toxtag to the angels from heaven. Toxtag threw or was thrown into the water. Finally, in his sleep, Toxtag saw three signs, one portending, one woe, and flight, and one annihilation. Naraman saw a garden full of trees in rows. Two hundred came out the trees. Enoch, now it's on to the next fragment, uh, fragment L. Enoch, the apostle, gave a message to the demons and their children. To you not a peace. The judgment on you is that you shall be bound for the sins you have committed. You shall see the destruction of your children ruling for a hundred and twenty years. Wild ass, the ibex, the ram, the goat, the gazelle, the onyx, the oryx of each, two hundred, a pair, the other wild beasts, birds and animals, and their wine, shall be six thousand jugs. Irritation of water, and their oil shall be, and it cuts to the next fragment, uh, father nuptials until the completion of his in fighting, and in the nest, Oya and Aya, he said to his brother, Get up, and we will take what our father has ordered us to. The pledge we have given of battle and the giants together and it's broken again goes to 67 not the something but of the line not the rainbow but the bow not the something but the firm not the sharpness of the blade but the strength of the ox not the eagle but his wing and i'm sure that this is a a, a prose that some other people know from some other quotation not the eagle but his wings, not the something but the gold, not the not the gold but the brass that hammers it, not the proud ruler but the diadem on his head, not the splendid cypress but the blank of the mountain, not he that engages in quarrels, but he that is true in his speech, not the evil fruit but the poison in it, not they that are placed in the skies but the god of all worlds, not the servant is proud but the lord that is above him. Not one that is sent, but the man that sent him. Thereupon Naraman said, And in another place I saw those that were weeping for the ruin that had befallen them, and whose cries and laments rose up to heaven. And also I saw another place, where there were tyrants and rulers in great number, who had lived in sin and evil deeds. When many were killed, four hundred thousand righteous, with fire, naphtha, and brimstone, 
And the angels veiled or covered or protected or moved out of sight Enoch, uh, Electi, Auditresses, and ravished them. They chose beautiful women and demanded them in marriage and sordid deeds, and all carried off severally. They were subjected to tasks and services. And they, from each city, and were ordered to serve the Messenians, were directed to prepare the Cusians to sweep and water the Persians, to the slaying the righteous, the good deeds, the elements, the crown, the diadem, the garland, the garment of light, the seven demons like a blacksmith, who binds or shuts, fastens, and looses, or opens or detaches, who from the seeds of something and serves the king, and offends when weeping with mercy the hand the pious gave, presents some buried idols. The Jews did good and evil, some make their god half demon, half god, killing the seven demons. The eye, the various colors that buy and bile, if, blank again, from the five elements, as if it were a means not to die. They fill themselves with food and drink. Their garment is this corpse and not firm. Its ground is not firm. Like someone imprisoned in this corpse, in bones, nerves, flesh, veins, and skin, and entered herself into it. Then he cries out over sun and moon, the just God's two flames, over the elements, the trees, and the animals. But God, Zerwan, in each epoch sends, an, uh, sends apostles, a Zarathustra, Buddha, Christ, Evil intention from where he came, the misguided recognized the five elements, the five kinds of trees, the five kinds of animals. We receive from Mani the Lord the five commandments to the three seals, living profession and wisdom, moon, rest from the power or deceit, own and keep the measured mixture, trees and wells in two, water and fruit, milk, he should not offend his brother. The wise here who like unto juniper leaves, much profit like a farmer who sows seed. In many, the hearer who knowledge is like unto a man that threw the dish called a frotag into milk. It became hard, not the part that ruin at first heavy like. First it is honored might shine six days. The hearer who gives alms to the elect is like unto a poor man that presents his daughter to the king. He reaches a position of great honor in the body of the elect. The food given to him as alms is purified in the same manner as a that by fire and wind beautiful clothes on a clean body turn witness fruit two hundred tree like firewood like a grain radiance the hearer in the world and the alms within the church are like unto a ship on the sea the towing line is in the hand of the tower on shore the sail is on board the ship the sea is the world the ship is the the is the alms the tower is the question mark the towing line question mark is the wisdom 214 the hearer is like unto the branch of a fruitless tree fruitless and the hearer's fruit that pious deeds the elect the hearer and vaman are like unto three brothers to whom some possessions were left by their father a piece of land and seed they became partners they reap and the hearer like an image of the king and it's broken again fragment d an image of the king cast of gold, the king gave presents. The hearer that copies a book is like unto a sick man that gave his thing to a man. The hearer that gives his daughter to the church is like a pledge who the father gave his son to learn to father pledge. Here again the hearer is like stumble is purified to. The soul from the church is like unto the wife of the soldier, or Roman who infantrist one shoe whoever with a denarius was the wind tore out one he was abashed from the ground ground and it breaks again sent the hearer that makes one is like unto a compassionate mother who had seven sons and the enemy killed all the hearer that has piety a well one on the shore of the sea one in the boat he that is on shore tows him that is in the boat he that is in the boat, something the sea, upwards to something like like a pearl, a diadem. Church like unto a man that fruit and flowers, then they praise, fruitful tree, like unto a man that bought a piece of land. On that piece of land there was a well, and in that well a bag full of drachmas, and the king was filled with wonder, share, pledge. Numerous hearer at 
like unto a garment, like to the master, like in a blacksmith, the goldsmith, to honor the blacksmith, to one, two. So you can see how those fragments, you could take them and combine it and come out with the the thing that makes sense. Okay, according to Lecoq, Turkey, and Mani the Third, the Museon, this this book I I believe he's written, order of pages according to Lecoq, uh, the photo published by Bang seems to support Lecoq's opinion. Uh, first page: Fire was going to come out, and I saw that the sun was at the point of rising, and that his center or dew, without increasing, above was going to start rolling. Then came a voice from the air above, calling me. It spoke thus. O oh, son of Virogdad, your affairs are lamentable. More than this you shall not see. Do not die now prematurely, but turn quickly back from here. And again, besides this voice, I heard the voice of Enoch, the apostle, from the south, without, however, seeing him at all. Speaking my name very lovingly, he called, and downwards from then. Second page. For the closed door of the sun will open. The sun's light and heat will descend and set your wings alight. You will burn and die, said he. Having heard these words, I beat my wings and quickly flew down from the air. I looked back. Dawn had, with the light of the sun, it had come to rise over the Kogmon Mountains. And again a voice came from above, bringing the command of Enoch the Apostle. It said, I call you, Varogdad. I know his direction. You, and it breaks up, you, now quickly, people also... And then a small scrap from the center of the page. The order of the page is uncertain. I shall see thereupon. Now Sam the giant was very angry and laid hands on Mahawai the giant with the intention I shall slay and kill you. Then the other giants, giants said or were told, do not be afraid for Sam the giant will want to kill you but I shall not let him. I myself shall damage. Thereupon Mahawai the giant was satisfied outside and left read the dream we have seen thereupon enoch thus and the trees that came out those are the egregory and the giants that came out of the women and over and pulled out over when they saw the apostle before the apostle those demons that were timid were very very glad at seeing the apostle all of them assembled before him also of those that were tyrants and criminals they were worried and much afraid then thereupon those powerful demons spoke thus to the pious apostle by us any further sin will not be committed my lord why have you imposed such a weighty injunction and we can see that this lines up with the book of enoch and other texts six fragmentary columns from the middle of the page <clears throat> poverty those who harass the happiness of the righteous on that account they shall fall into eternal ruin and distress into that fire, the mother of all conflagrations and the foundation of all ruined tyrants. And when these sinful misbegotten sons of ruin in those crevices, and you have not been better, in error you thought you would this false power eternally have, you all this iniquity, you that call to us with the voice of falsehood, neither did we reveal ourselves on your account so that you could see us, nor thus ourselves through the praise and greatness that to us was given to you. But sinners is visible where out of this fire your soul will be prepared for the transfer to eternal ruin and as for you sinful misbegotten sons of the wrathful self confounders of the true words of that holy one disturbers of the actions of good deed aggressors upon piety somethingers of the living who there it breaks up again column e and on brilliant wings they shall fly and soar further outside and above that fire and shall gaze into its depth and height and those righteous that will stand around it outside and above, they themselves shall have power over that great fire and over everything in it, and something blaze and souls that they are purer and stronger than the great fire of ruin that sets the world ablaze. They shall stand around it outside and above, and splendor shall shine over them. Further outside and above it they shall fly after those souls that may try to escape from the fire, and that, and then they throw those souls back into the fire. The four angels with the two hundred demons, they took and imprisoned all the helpers that were in the heavens, and the angels themselves descended from the heaven to the earth. And when the two hundred demons saw those angels, they were much afraid and worried. They assumed the shape of men and hid themselves. Thereupon the angels forcibly removed the men from the demons, laid them aside, and put watchers over them. The giants, and it breaks up, were sons, with each other in bodily union, 
with each other self and the that had been born to them they forcibly removed them from the demons and they led one half of them eastwards and the other half westwards on the skirts of four huge mountains towards the foot of the Sameru mountain into thirty-two towns which the living spirit had prepared for them in the beginning and one calls that place Arian Wizan or Arian Wizan and those men are or were in the first trained in the first arts and crafts they made the angels they made something and the angels and to the demons and they went to fight and those two hundred demons fought a hard battle with the four angels until the four angels used fire naphtha and brimstone and then there's the next chapter and what they had seen in the heaven among the gods and also what they had seen in hell their native land and furthermore what they had seen on earth all that they began to teach Hendiatus to the men Shamazad, the two sons, were born by. One of them he named Ohia. In Sogdian he is called Sham the giant. And again, a second son was born to him. He named him Ohia. Its Sogdian equivalent is Patsam. As for the remaining giants, they were born to the other demons and Yaksas. Uh, Colophon completed the chapter on the coming of the 200 demons. And there's the M500, a small fragment. Manliness and powerful tyranny, he or you shall not die. The giant Sam and his brother will live eternally, for in the whole world in power and strength and in they have no equal. Quotations and allusions. Uh, Middle Persian. And in the coming of the two hundred demons there are two paths, the herding speech and the hard labor. These belong or lead to hell. The herding speech and the hard labor. The first page before they were, and all the something fulfilled their tasks lawfully angels and all the angels fulfilled their tasks lawfully now they became excited and irritated for the following reason namely the two hundred demons came down to the sphere from the high heaven and the something in the world they became excited and irritated for their lifelines and the connections of their pneumatic veins are joined to sphere completed the exposition of the three worlds here begins the coming of jesus and his bringing the religion to adam and Sitil, you should care, and then we have Coptic. Earthquake and malice happened in the watch post of the great king of honor, namely the Egregori, who arose at the time when they were, and there descended those who were sent to confound them. Uh, it's a different, these are all different uh, translations of different texts that uh, correlate or are a part of this. Now attend and behold how the great king of honor, who is Evoya, is in the third heaven. He is with the wrath and a rebellion. When malice and wrath arose in his camp, namely the Egregori of heaven, who in his watch district rebelled and descended to the earth, they did all deeds of malice. They revealed the arts in the world and the mysteries of heaven to the men. Rebellion and ruin came about on the earth. Then and Parthian, fragment of a treatise entitled Reding Wifers, Commentary on Mani's Opus, Ardahang, and the story about the great fire, like unto the way in which the fire, with powerful wrath, swallows this world and enjoys it, like unto the way in which this fire, that is in the body, swallows the exterior fire, that is, in fruit and food, and enjoys it. Again, like unto the story in which two brothers who found a treasure, and a pursuer lacerated each other, and they died like unto the fight in which Oyah and Raphael lacerated each other, and they vanished like unto the story in which a lion cub, a calf in a wood, or on a meadow, and a fox lacerated each other, and they vanished or died. Thus the great fire swallows both of the fires. Then another copy of this text is Arabic from Middle Persian, al Gadanfar. In Sakao's edition of Baruni's The Book of the Giants by Mani of Babylon, is filled with stories about these antediluvian giants, amongst whom Sam and Nariman. On account of the malice and rebellion that had arisen in the watchpost of the great king of honor, namely the Egregori, from whom the heavens had descended to the earth, on their account the four angels received their orders. They bound the Egregori with eternal fetters in the prison of the dark. Their sons were destroyed upon the earth. Coptic again, Manic Psalm book. The righteous who were burnt in the fire they endured. This multitude that were wiped out, four thousand. Enoch also, the sage, the transgressors being evil, 
four hundred thousand righteous, the years of Enoch. Before the Egregory rebelled and descended from heaven, a prison had been built for them in the depth of the earth beneath the mountains. Before the sons of the giants were born who knew not righteousness and piety among themselves, thirty-six towns had been prepared and erected, so that the sons of the giants should live in them, that they came to beget who live a thousand years. Mirror image, this is order of pages unknown, uh, Parthian. Mirror image distributed the men, and Enoch was veiled and moved out of sight. They took afterwards with donkey goads, slaves, and waterless trees, then, and imprisoned the demons, and of them seven and twelve, three thousand two hundred and eighty, the beginning of King Vistasp, in the palace he flamed forth, or in the brilliant palace, and at night, then to the broken gate, the men, the physicians, the merchants, the farmers at sea, the armored, he came out, the appendix in Parthian, from the end of a hymn. A peaceful sovereign was King Vistasp, in Arian, Wizon, Wachman and Zarel, the, the sovereign's queen. Kudos received the faith, the prince they have secured a place in the heavenly hall, and quietude for ever and ever. So it's just saying, it's just a, a hymn saying that he was a peaceful sovereign, and that they received their place in heaven and hell, and, and who they were. But you notice that it's Arian and Archion. Uh, now again in, in Sogdian, that was Parthian, and now again in Sogdian, small fragment, order of pages uncertain, because the house of the gods, eternal joy and good. For so it is said at that time that Yima was in the world, and at the time of the new moon, the blessed denizens of the world all assembled, all they offered five garlands in homage, and Yima accepted those garlands, and those that and great kingship was his, and on them, and acclamations, and from that pious he placed the garlands on his head, the denizens of the world. You see that the translations are extremely rough. Summary of the Book of the Trades. We've already been through the Book of the Watchers in Enoch and so this will continue on with what's happened there. So, I bridge you the fragments, and now we're going to put it back together. The fragments of and allusions to the Manichaean version of the Book of the Giants have been recovered in medieval manuscripts in various languages, including Middle Persian, Sogdian, Uyghur, Coptic, Parthian, and Latin. The following is a summary of the fret the surviving fragments and allusions, which I have attempted extremely tentatively to put in sequence. The summaries are also very tentative. M1. The two hundred demons descend to earth. Their descent from heaven stirs up the other heavenly beings. They descend because of the beauty of the women they saw there. And they reveal forbidden arts and heavenly mysteries in order to seduce these women. And they bring about ruin on the earth. Enoch warns that the coming of the two hundred demons will lead only to hurting speech and hard labor. They then subjugate the human race, killing hundreds of thousands of the righteous in battle, forcibly marrying beautiful women, and enslaving the nations. The angels veil Enoch, and the righteous endure the burning, and Enoch the sage is mentioned. Uh, Samazad, Samhaza, begets two giant sons, Sahim, Oyach, and Patsam, Naraman, or Achya, Chaya, and the other demons and Yaksas beget the rest of the giants. So we see that there is one split lineage that came directly from Samyaza, uh, and that, that that one is notable and mentioned, and that all the others come, the other Yaksas beget the rest of the giants. The giants grow up and wreak ruin upon the earth and the human race. The lamentation of humanity reaches up to heaven. Yima, a transmogrification of the Jewish God according to Manny's cosmology, accepts the homage of humankind as they plead for help. And someone boasts that Psalm and his brother will live and rule forever in their unequaled power and strength. The giant Hobabas, or Hombaba, robs someone of his wife, and the giants fall out among themselves and begin killing one another and other creatures. Psalm and his brother are mentioned, 
It appears that Psalm has a dream in which a tablet was thrown in the water. It seems to have borne three signs, one portending woe, one portending their flight, and one portending their destruction. Naraman then has a dream about a garden full of trees and rows, and two hundred of something, perhaps trees, it is trees, are mentioned. Um, someone recites a list of proverbs involving contrasts, usually between the lesser and the greater, or the derivative from the source. Naraman tells how he saw in the dream some who were weeping and lamenting, and many others who were sinful rulers. The giant Mahoe, son of Virogdad, Barakel, of 1 Enoch 6-7, hears a cautioning voice as he flies along at sunrise, and he is guided to safety by Enoch the Apostle and the heavenly voice, which warn him to descend before the sun sets his wings on fire, shades of Icarus. He lands, and the voice leads him to Enoch. And fragment M15. Enoch interprets this dream, indicating that the trees represented the egregory, the watchers, and also mentioning the giants who were born of women, something the trees are pulled out of. In M16, someone reports that someone ordered him not to run away, but to bring the message written on two stone tablets, showing it first to Naraman. He has brought them in order to share the contents of one tablet pertaining to the demons with the giants. Samazad tells him to read the writing by Enoch. Enoch the Apostle gives a message of judgment to the demons and their children, telling them that they will have no peace and that they will see the destruction of their children. He refers to the giants, ruling for 120 years, and then he predicts either an era of earthly fecundity, presumably after the flood, or else the flood itself, and he's predicting the flood itself. Psalm exhorts the other giants to cheer up and eat, but they are too sorrowful to eat and instead fall asleep. Mahoe goes to Atan Bush, otherwise known as Utnapistim, either another giant or another name for Enoch, and tells him all. When Mahoe returns, Psalm has a dream in which he ascends to heaven. He sees the water of the earth consumed with heat, and a demon comes out of the water. Some beings, the protecting spirits, are invisible, but he sees the heavenly rulers. Then M19, Sam, Samazad, and Mahoe have a conversation. So remember that Samazad is Samyaza. Mahoe mentions his father, Varogdad. There are obscure references to weapons and a blessing on someone who saw something and escaped death, or would have escaped death. Sam and Mahoe search for something. Someone gives satisfactory assurance to Mahoe that he will be protected from Sam, but nevertheless Sam and Mahoe fall out and begin to fight. The wicked demons are glad to see the Apostle Enoch and assemble timidly before him. Apparently they promise to reform their ways and they ask for mercy. Uh, the wicked demons are glad to see the Apostle Enoch and assemble timidly before him. Enoch warns the demons that they will be taken from a fire to face eternal damnation, despite their belief that they would never lose their misused power. He also addresses their sinful, misbegotten sons, the giants, and describes how the righteous will fly over the fire of damnation and gloat over the souls inside it, and guard that they stay in there, I would add. Uh, M23, they, presumably the demons, take some heavenly helpers hostage. As a result, the angels descend from heaven, terrifying the 200 demons, who take human form and hide among human beings. The angels separate out the human beings, and set a watch over them. They seize the giants from the demons and lead them, the children of the giants, to safety in 32 distant towns prepared for them by the living spirit at Aryan Wiesen, the traditional homeland of the Indo-Iranians, in the vicinity of the sacred Mount Sumeru and other mountains. These people originated the arts and crafts. The 200 demons fight a massive and fiery battle with the four angels. M24, a tan bush does battle, accompanied by watchers and giants, and three of the giants are killed. An angel and others are also killed. Oyach and Ayach resolve to keep their promise to do battle, and they boast of their prowess. Four angels, by divine command, bind the Igrigori with everlasting chains in a dark prison, and annihilate their children. Even before the rebellion of the Igrigori, this prison had been built for them under the mountains. In addition, 
Thirty-six towns had been prepared for the habitation of the wicked and long-lived sons of the giants before they were even born. Oyah, or Aya, the primordial monster Leviathan, and the archangel Raphael engage in a great battle, and they vanished, according to one tradition. Oyah survived the flood and fought this battle after it. Three thousand two hundred and eighty years passed between the time of Enoch and the time of King Vishtasp, who ruled at the time of the prophet Zoroaster, who, along with Buddha and Christ, was an apostle who came before the final apostle Manny. There's a couple interesting things I wanted to mention there. That um, when they talked about they're taken from the fire, it just endure the burning, and Enoch the sage is mentioned. Now that ties into what we've been talking about recently or and some things that I saw that again that Zen Garcia was talking about and his amazing stuff that he's tied up and what he was talking about there is that the righteous actually in between this period and uh, and Christ coming back to earth or coming to earth for the first time the, the first appearance of the Savior that the righteous had to endure that time period in hell because they had no savior to come down and take them from Sheol and that that is what happens in the Chronicles of Longinus and so go and check out that work I've posted it, it's part of this playlist it's been part of the playlist that this will be part of so you can see it there or go to Zen's work at Endeavor Freedom and check out the Chronicles of Longinus or Longinus and the Thracian Chronicles and you'll see what I'm talking about there and uh, after that we also the other thing that I wanted to notice is that for some reason this person believes that the final apostle was Mani or Mani an effort to nuance this version is given after the summary so A1 the angelic watchers beget the Nephilim and the giants, perhaps the same creatures, but perhaps not, through miscegenation with mortal women. Uh, these rapacious monsters inflict bloodshed and injustice upon the earth and destruction upon the sea, animals, plants, cattle, and humanity. All this is reported to Enoch, the scribe of interpretation. Enoch addresses God, praising him for his glory, knowledge, strength, and creative acts. A number, a number of giants, including Hobabas and Humbaba, Mahoe, and perhaps the watcher Barak L have a conversation in which they discuss killing perhaps of human beings. Following hints from the Manichaean version and the Midrash of Samyaza, perhaps we should reconstruct here an episode in which the giants have a first pair of dreams predicting the Great Flood. If so, the first dream seems to involve the effacing of a writing tablet by submerging it in water. Stuckenbrook also suggests that a fragment which refers to three shoots in a garden belongs to the second parable. The first dream may have told of an angel doing the effacing as a symbol of the destruction wrought by the flood. The second may have told of an angel descending and cutting down all but three shoots, representing the sons of Noah, in the garden. Mahawe consults Enoch the first time. It is possible that the first tablet was introduced at this point. These episodes are entirely lost, but their existence is deduced by later references in the fragments. The giants Oya and Mahoe have a conversation in which Mahoe tells Oya something he heard while in the presence of his, Mahoe's father, the watcher Barakel. Oya responds that he too has heard of four marvels, and he starts to make a comparison which pertains to a woman giving birth. There is a conversation among the giants in which one of them admits that, despite his own might, he has been unable to prevail in war against some heavenly beings, presumably the archangels. Oya mentions an oppressive dream which has disturbed him, and someone tells the giant Gilgamesh to recount his dream as well. Oya says something to his brother Hahya about the watcher Azazel, the watchers and the giants. In another fragment that may continue this speech, one of the giants resigns himself that there is no escape and that he and the others must die for their misdeeds. He refers to a vision that hinders him from sleeping. Someone enters the assembly of the giants. Perhaps a conversation continues in which the giants anticipate with dread their coming destruction in the flood for their sins, in which they will be stripped of their form and reduced to being evil spirits. 
The Watchers tell the Giants that they themselves are imprisoned and perhaps that the Giants are being defeated. Mahaway and the two tablets are mentioned. The second tablet is now read. It is a letter from Enoch to the Watcher Samyaza and his companions, and they are rebuked for their and their sons the Giants' corrupt acts, which have come to the attention of the Archangel Raphael. They are warned of imminent destruction and ordered to release their hostages and to pray. Nevertheless, Oya informs the giants of a message from Gilgamesh and Hobabas, which involves the cursing of the princes and which cheers the giants up. The two giants Oya and Haya have dreams. Haya describes his in the assembly of the giants. He dreamed of gardeners watering a garden which produced great shoots, but a disaster of some sort destroyed the garden in a deluge of water and fire. The other giants are unable to interpret his dream. Haya proposes that they consult Enoch for an interpretation. Then his brother Oya reports that he too had a dream, in which God descended to the earth, thrones were set up, and God sat enthroned amid a multitude of angels and presided over a judgment based on the opening of certain books. The giants, presumably unable to interpret this dream either, summon Mahoe and send him to Enoch, whom he has encountered before, to ask him to interpret the dreams. Mahoe takes wing and flies across the great desert until Enoch sees him and calls to him. Mahoe refers to this as his second visit and makes the request. Bits of Enoch's interpretation may survive in a fragment that mentions the violent deaths of a number of watchers, Nephilim, and giants, and also in a small fragment that says, No peace to you. Enoch pronounces an eschatological or post-diluvian blessing of earthly prosperity. Presumably, much of the story came after this point and is now lost. Reconstruction of the Aramaic Book of Giants remains extremely subjective, but a number of objective factors limit the possible arrangements and point us in certain directions. The most important external factor is the assured sequence of fragments in some of the manuscripts based on physical joins. So we see that they're having problems with putting these things together and seeing how clearly they line up. Uh, a third factor is the internal evidence of the fragments themselves. Stuckenbrook, building on Garcia Martinez's comments, allows for passages that pertain to the early part of the Watcher's Giants narrative when the Giants are free agents after they, or better the Watchers, have been imprisoned. He also points to the reference to two tablets in A10, with the second tablet being read later than the first, and to Mahoe's second visit to Enoch in A13. In both cases, earlier lost portions of the narrative are hinted at. The biggest difference between Suckenbrook's sequencing and those of some other commentators is that he reconstructs two pairs of two dreams. Bayer, Reeves, and Garcia uh, Martinez group the fragments pertaining to dreams into one episode. Cook, however, does reconstruct multiple dream episodes, although not in precisely the same order as Struckenbrook, and Puch or Puek accepts the necessity of an earlier pair of dreams, although he does not accept that the material assigned to the second dream by Stuckenbrook in A5 belongs there, he puts it correctly, in my view, in the first dream. So we see that they really are fighting over how these reconstructions go together. And we see that the founder of the Manichaean religion was the Apostle Manny, in 216-76 to 76 CE, who was raised in southern Mesopotamia in a Jewish-Christian Baptist sect called the Elkazites. From age 12 on, Manny began to have visions. Eventually, his visionary experiences led to his being expelled from the sect, and he then founded his own religion, sending out missions to Iran, India, Syria, and Egypt. Late in his life, he fell out of royal favor and was sent to prison where he died. He wrote detailed scriptures so that his doctrines would be preserved forever, even going so far as to invent a new script to write them in. But over time, nearly all of these scriptures have been lost. This makes it very difficult to reconstruct his original theology. We know that he drew on other world religions to interpret himself as the culminating revelatory intermediary for Christianity, Zoroastrianism, and Buddhism. We also know that the Manichaean religion taught an extremely complicated system, Gnostic dualism, centered around a cosmological myth about the war between the originally pristine realms of light and darkness. The physical universe was created as a trick to liberate the captive sparks of light in living beings from the realm of darkness. There were two classes of practicing Manichaeans, the elect who lived 
ascetic monastic lifestyles of celibacy, vegan, uh, vegetarianism, etc., and the hearers who supported the elect financially and otherwise in the hope of being reincarnated themselves as elect in due course. Although most of Manny's scriptures are themselves lost, lists of the titles of these documents survive in works by both friendly and hostile writers who wrote in Coptic, Greek, Arabic, and even Chinese. Allowing for minor corruptions, all the lists mention the same seven works, usually in more or less the same order. These are the Gospel, the Treasure of Life, the Pragmatia, the Treaties, the Book of Mysteries, the Book of Giants, the Epistles, and the Psalms. For our immediate purposes, the only one of interest is the Book of Giants, a work apparently composed in Syriac, an Eastern dialect of Aramaic, and the book was entirely lost until the 20th century, but scant ref references to it survived in Latin, Greek, and Arabic indicating that it involved battles of the ancient giants. Then, about a century ago, many highly fragmentary Manichaean works written in Central Asian languages were recovered archaeologically at Turfan in China, and much of the find remains unpublished even at present. Uh, should we read that again? Then, about a hundred years ago, many fragmentary Manichaean works written in Central Asian languages were recovered at Turfan in China, and much of the find remains unpublished. Among the published fragments are many badly eroded manuscripts of the Book of Giants in various languages. So we see again that they have found this very clearly. They probably have a very clear, good book of it. And we are not given that translation. The Manichaean versions adapted the story of the giants to fit Iranian mythology. Uh, Skiervo discusses these adaptations at length and three of the most striking adjustments have to do with the names of the major characters. Sam or Sam is the name of the immortal dragon slayer in later Iranian epic. His name is given to the giant Ohiyah, and Ohiyah's brother Hahia is given the name Naraman, who in Iranian epic is a figure closely connected to Sam, either identified with him or presented as one of his close relatives. The name of the father of the giant Mahoe, the demon Varogdad, means given by lightning in Persian, a loose translation of Barak El, which is Hebrew for lightning of God. The watcher Barak El seems to be the father of Mahawe in the Aramaic version of the Book of Giants. Between Mani's Book of Giants and the stories of the giants related in the Enoch literature and in Jubilees, these were already good indicators of Mani's use of earlier Jewish traditions a use confirmed by the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. These consisted of many hundreds of parchment and papyrus manuscripts in Hebrew and Aramaic, with a few also in Greek, most of which had rotted away into tens of thousands of fragments. Fragments survived as some of the Enoch books in Aramaic, and also the Book of Jubilees in Hebrew. J.T. Millick has also discovered roughly six to ten extremely poorly preserved manuscripts of an Aramaic Book of Giants. Apparently the document used by Manny as the basis for his scriptural work. These manuscripts give no indication of being sectarian compositions. Their paleographic dates roughly across the 1st century BCE, so presumably the book was composed before this, although how long before remains open to question. The kernel of the same story appears in the Bible in Genesis 6, 1-4. But, as with the Book of the Watchers, it remains debatable whether the traditions about the Watchers and Giants are creative expansions of the Genesis passage, or independent transmissions of stories that have been summarized and truncated in Genesis. So, and then it talks about the Midrash of Samyaza, which Millik has published and translated in his edition of some of the Aramaic fragments of the Book of the Giants. And this work tells how, at the time of the corrupt generation of the Flood, the angels Samyaza and Azazel make a bet with God that if they were to descend from heaven to earth, they would be able to resist the lure of the evil inclination. But after descending, they promptly lose the bet. They notice the beauty of mortal women and cannot restrain themselves from becoming sexually involved with them. Soon they find themselves revealing heavenly secrets to their mortal wives. Semyaza begets sons named Heia and Aheia. The angel Metatron, another name for the deified Enoch in the Hecalot traditions, sends them a warning of the coming flood. Heia and Aheia each have a prognostic dream. In the first, an angel descends from heaven and scrapes an enormous stone tablet with writing on it, which was spread across the whole world until only four words remain. In the second, there is a garden full of trees and gems, 
but an angel descends and cuts down everything but one tree with three branches. Both dreams predict the coming of the flood and the destructions of all human beings, except Noah and his three sons. The giants are then killed in the flood, but are consoled by the fact that mortals will use their names in incantations, and thus their fame will never cease. Samyaza repents and suspends himself upside down between heaven and earth. Azazel refuses to repent and becomes a demon who entices men to corrupt deeds and who bears the sins of Israel on the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16, 7-10 The numerous and striking parallels with the Book of Giants are obvious. Although there is only one pair of dreams in the Midrash of Samyaza, Stuckenbrook argues that the original Book of Giants had two sets, and that this may well be true also of the Manichaean version. Moving now from history of transmission to background influences, we should note that the Aramaic Book of Giants draws on ancient Near Eastern myth rather... Anyways, it gets into the Epic of Gilgamesh and, and Enkidu. Uh, and we see that that was just completely clear what has happened there. Moving now from history of transmission to background influences... The Aramaic Book of Giants draws on ancient Near Eastern myth, rather, as the Manichaean version draws on Iranian. Two of the evil giants in the Aramaic version are named Gilgamesh and Hobabas. Gilgamesh is an epic figure in Sumerian and Akkadian literature, best known from the Epic of Gilgamesh, a work whose importance in ancient Mesopotamia was comparable to that of the Homeric epics in ancient Greece. According to the epic, Il Gilgamesh, a huge, semi-divine man, has many adventures with his friend, the wild man Enkidu. One of these is the slaying of the monster Humbaba in the cedar forest, but Enkidu dies tragically and Gilgamesh sets out to discover the secret of immortality in order to avoid his friend's fate. He meets Utnapishtim, the Babylonian version of Noah, the only man to survive the flood. Unlike Noah, Utnapishtim was made immortal by the gods. Nevertheless, Gilgamesh fails in his quest, eventually dying and leaving only his heroic fame behind him. The giants Gilgamesh and Hobabas are reflexes of the Gilgamesh and Humbaba Huwawa of the Gilgamesh epic. Likewise, a Sogdian text of the Manichaean version refers to Atanbush, who is either another giant or Enoch under another name. Enoch also survived the flood and was made immortal. A tan bush is clearly a reflex of Utnapishtim, and we may assume that he appeared also in some lost passage or passages in the Aramaic Book of Giants. So now, knowing the, knowing this more clearly, we can see that that's not what happened. It's just that they simply gave their name to that person. That that's the name that in their culture that they had given to that person. When really, there it was two cultures on the opposite or not not even necessarily on the opposite, but on just in different places looking at the same person and calling him a different name. But really and then retelling the story and you can see how it's kind of a case of the broken telephone where when he's speaking to one culture that has one language, that entity um is given a name in their language, but to another culture he's given another name. And so you see that it's the same story, and then there's just a bit of broken telephone in the way that the story is told. Just the fact that they have different names, um, we can actually correlate and see that those names really are the same name, and they're the same person over and over. Like Samyaza, and and Gilgamesh, and Utnapishtim, that these are really they're the same people, just with a different name to a different culture. A hard arrow bow, he that Sam said, Blessed be, had he seen this, he would not have died. Then Shamazad said to Sam, All that Mahawe has done is spoiled. Thereupon he said to so-and-so, We are until, and that are in the fiery hell, as my father Varogdaz was. Shamazad said, It is true what he says. He says one of thousands for one of thousands. Varogdad, Hobabes, robbed Ar of Noxtag, his wife. Thereupon the giants began to kill each other and to abduct their wives. The creatures, too, began to kill each other. Psalm before the sun, one hand in the air, the other towards the ground. Whatever he obtained to his brother imprisoned over Toxtag to the angels from heaven. Toxtag threw or was thrown into the water. Finally, in his sleep, Toxtag saw three signs, and pretending, one woe and fight, and one annihilation. Naraman saw a garden full 
of trees in rows. 200 came out of the trees. So because it's so broken up, we really lose the uh, effect and the power of the parable. It makes one wonder if it's not been broken up somewhat on purpose. It's very difficult to piece this together properly. But when you do piece it together, we see an interesting story that continues on in the story of the Book of Enoch and the story that we've come to know here. And mainly being that the fallen angels uh, have bred with humans and that this is the, what they're talking about. And they're talking about the story of their first children and how they were killed. And so this is how the angels, this is part of how the angels did that was to have the egregory and have them go to have them go to, go to war against each other by having this affair go on between the king and another giant's wife and that that go drives them to war and then he goes on with several parables and what this is actually saying is that one of these giants one of these men that was a giant or was part of that actually had his own uh, dream fugue in which he was given this parable. And that's what we're reading about. So I think it's pretty interesting. Um, like this part. They took and imprisoned all the helpers that were in the heavens, and the angels themselves descended from the heaven to the earth. And when the 200 demons saw those angels, they were much afraid and worried. They assumed the shape of men and hid themselves. Thereupon the angels forcibly removed the men from the demons, laid them aside, and put watchers over them. Then it cuts up and it says, The giants. Then it cuts up and says, Were sons with each other in bodily union. And it breaks up again. With each other self something. And the something that had been born to them, they forcibly removed them from the demons. And they led one half of them twenty eastwards, and the other half westwards, on the skirts of four huge mountains, towards the foot of the Sumeru mountain, into thirty-two towns which the living spirit had prepared for them in the beginning. And one calls that place Arian Wizan, and those men are trained, or were, or knowledgeable, in the first arts and crafts. They made something the angels, and to the demons, they went to fight, and those two hundred demons fought a hard battle with the four angels, until the angels used fire, naphtha, and brimstone. And that's where it breaks up again. Very interesting stuff there. Here begins Sansai's question, the world. And again, Sansai asked the light apostle, This world where mankind lives, why does one call it birth death? And what they had seen in the answer carries on, and what they had seen in the heavens among the gods, and also what they had seen in hell, their native land, and furthermore what they had seen on earth, and all that they began to teach to the men, to Shamazad, to Sachmizad, two sons were born by. One of them he named Oya in Sogdi, and he is called Sam the Giant. And again, a second son was born to him. He named him Ahia, its Sogdian equivalent. And again, a second son was born to him. He named him Aya, its Sogdian equivalent, is Potsam. As for the remaining giants, they were born to the other demons and Yaksas. And Colophon completed the chapter on the coming of the 200 demons. Uh, and it carries on in Sogdian. Manliness in powerful tyranny, he or you shall not die. The giant Sam and his brother will live eternally, for in the whole world in power and strength. So it's like a hymn or a praise to to the giant Sam, saying that he's all-powerful and that he shall not die. They didn't believe he could die. And then, and then it carries on quotations and allusions in Middle Persian. And in the coming of the 200 demons, there are two paths, the herding speech and the hard labor. These belong to or lead to hell. Now attend and behold how the great king of honor who is Avoya is in the third heaven. He is something with the wrath and something in a rebellion. 
when malice and wrath arose in his camp, namely the egregory of heaven, who in his watch district rebelled and descended to the earth. They did all deeds of malice, they revealed the arts in the world and the mysteries of heaven to the men. Rebellion and ruin then came about on the earth. That's in Coptic. Then in Parthian, a fragment of a treatise entitled Rudding Weifers, Commentary on Manny's Opus, and the story about the great fire, like unto the way in which the fire with, with powerful wrath swallows this world and enjoys it, like unto the way in which this fire that is in the body swallows the exterior fire that is, in fruit and food enjoy, and enjoys it. Again, like unto the story in which two brothers who found a treasure and a pursuer lacerated each other, and they died like unto the fight in which Oyah the Levi and the Leviathan and Raphael lacerated each other, and they vanished, like unto the story in which a lion cub, a calf in a wood, or in a meadow, and a fox lacerated each other, and they vanished or died. Thus the great fire swallows, etc., both of the fires. That carries on from where it says, And again, since I ask the light apostle, this world where mankind lives, why does one call it birth-death? Uh, samsara chin sheng, sh sheng shu so it's chinese sheng su so that's interesting that he's saying since i asked the light apostle this why does one call it birth death and then that story is the one that should be connected next to it it and it goes like unto the story of the great fire that swallows this world and enjoys it like unto the way in which this fire that is in the body swallows the exterior fire that is fruit and food and enjoys it Again, like unto the story in which two brothers found a treasure, and a pursuer lacerated each other, and they died. So you see that that's the piece that should be connected there, and it's pretty simple to connect it. It wouldn't take too much, really, to put those together, but they're, they're telling us that, it, that they can't put it together. So this is why I've taken some time to release this to you, is that I figured I may as well put it together a little more sensibly than the way that it's laid out to us because it's laid out again extremely poorly I was just listening to Zen Garcia again the other day and recently and there was a really funny part that came up and I noticed this all the time as well this funny part that came up where they were talking about Longinus and Lo Longinus and the spear of destiny and, and Longinus and how he was blinded in one eye and how when he uh, speared Jesus Jesus on the cross that the blood and the water that shot out into his eye healed his blinded eye his long blinded eye and that when you check out the mainstream wikipedia or the mainstream version of the story they tell you oh no it somehow cleared up an infection that had long been bothering him but that's not what had happened he had a long uh disabled eye from war uh <clears throat> so he had been mortally or nearly mortally wounded and blinded in his eye and it completely healed it so uh you see again their their petty attempts and and their p petty ways that they take these things apart and make them seem like they're not important and again like this one you can see that it's an incredible story but they have taken it and broken it they've chopped it up into a, a uh, enough of a destructive manner that it's difficult to put it together properly again. So again, what it's saying that's interesting is that on Sumeru, in this in-between world, that there, uh, I guess it would be the lower parts of heaven, that there are these towns created, and 36 or 32 towns. The heaven of Indra is situated before the four peaks of the Meru and consists of 32 cities of divas, So, the Book of Giants has so far been attested in the following languages. Middle Persian, da 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 da. Uh, thus, the Book of Giants has so far only been transmitted in the East Manichaean tradition by the collection of texts in Berlin, St. Petersburg, and Kyoto. Nothing is left of the original Aramaic text. Gee, I wonder why. But through the use of material from the Book of Giants and Coptic Manichaean writings, the work had also become known as the Manichaeans of Western countries. So again, what I'm, what I'm getting to here, what's interesting, is that the Book of Enoch was written by him 
at least 300 BC or quite a distance back uh, before the Christian era. So what we see that's interesting here is that God hid Enoch until the appointed time. And if this information had been out for the last 3,000 years or 2,000 years and been part of the, the real public consciousness, if he'd been able to put these pieces together for all this time, humankind could have known for that entire time that these stories were real and could have gone back to God. And even after finding it, look how long it's taken for them to put it together and put it out. And we hear very little of it. This is a very well-kept secret, a very well-guarded secret. And then even the parts that they let out are only portions of the actual text and they're missing major chunks that have to be filled in by us. And as you see, we've had to go to at least 20 different sources to get all this information. So carrying on about the giants and Satan himself. The book of giants tells the story of those demons who were chained up by the living spirit, assisted by his seven sons in the seven lower firmaments of the sky and of whom 200 had been able to free themselves and return to earth. Here, the human race had already spread, and it was the period of the Apostle Enoch. The demons, traditionally called guardians, subjugated humanity and established a tyrannical rule of terror, and with the daughters of mankind they begot a race of giants. The extant fragments mention one of the leaders of the demons, Sach Mizad, Middle Persian, uh, and then you see S-X-M-Y-Z, which is Samyaza, Samyaza, and Shmoizid. His sons, the giants, Sham, Sogd, Sham, Shem, and Naraman, another leader, who's under Virogdad, which is that king Virogdad. His son, Mahawe, and other names, they describe the fight among the demons the killing of 400,000 just men, and the struggle of Shamas against the sea monster Leviathan, and the terrible nightmares announcing the punishment of the demons. To seek their interpretation, the winged Mahawai is sent to the apostle Enoch, who was carried to heaven. Finally, the four avenging angels, identified as Raphael, Michael, Gabriel, and Israel, or Uriel, were told to put an end to the evil doings of the demons and incarcerated them and their sons, i.e. the giants. So just another uh, place there where it's, it's identified. The Qumran fragments of the Enoch book also resemble the Manichaean book of giants because they consider figures of the Mesopotamian Gilgamesh epic as giants. And this is from Millik's theory. Okay. Despite the names of Sam and Naraman, known from the Iranian epic tradition, the story of the giants is not of Iranian origin. Due to Ghazanfar's reference to these figures, Kumant had once assumed the Book of Giants to be of Iranian origin, but the Turfan texts and the Dead Sea Scrolls contradicted this theory. The Iranian names in the Book of Giants in the East Manichaean tradition are translations, not the original. Today an Iranian influence can at most be assumed. So you see that, again, it, it is clearly that these beings were all over the earth and had just different names given to them. So welcome back to Flat Water and Flat Earth. What I'm talking about today is the tides. The mainstream definition and explanation for tides are that they're caused by the moon and the moon's passage around the earth. The mainstream model says that the moon is pulling on the water and causing the tides. However, we see that the mainstream model fails miserably in describing and creating the phenomenon of the tides. Their explanation is sorely lacking.
what we see is that the time cycle of the moon moving and the tides are absolutely not linked. They are not related whatsoever. And so what we see is that the cycle of the moon moving over the earth has nothing to do with and is not linked whatsoever with the tides. So it's puzzled man for thousands of years just what is causing the tides. And I think that with the recent discoveries that have been made and some of the pieces that we've put together here that we can now come to the conclusion and find the obvious logic in that the tides are made by the in-sucking seas of the North Pole. This is not necessarily the only place that the Earth would intake water to create the tides. What this is linked to is the cosmic breath streams that were discussed in Heaven and Earth. So I'll read from them now. On the non-revolution of the Earth around the Sun, and on the existence of a summer and of a winter cosmic breath stream. From Heaven and Earth by Gabrielle Henriette. Copernicus put forward the hypothesis of the revolution of the Earth around the Sun in order to explain the cycle of the seasons. His theory is not very satisfactory, seeing that the Earth is supposed to be at its greatest distance from the Sun in the summer during the hot weather, and at its shortest distance in the winter when the temperature is at its lowest. These unusual conditions, which clearly contradict the laws of nature, as regards the effect of heat, are, it is said, due to the angle formed by the rays of the sun as they fall on the Earth's surface. It is also stated that the opposition of the seasons north and south of the equator is due to a tilt of the Earth, first on one side and then on the other, which conveniently occurs at the right moment. Nothing is said, however, of the shifting of the waters of the sea and rivers which this change in the center of gravity and in the position of the earth would inevitably bring twice a year. It might also be assumed that under those conditions very high constructions would swerve from the vertical. The American skyscrapers and the Eiffel Tower, for instance, cannot be seen to lean right or left according to the seasons, although this should be a logical and natural consequence of the alternate inclination attributed to the earth. It must reasonably be said that the circumstances which readily explain in the most extraordinary and unlikely way the cause of the seasons are not credible, especially in view of the fact that Copernicus, when he published his theories on the movement of the earth in his treaty on the revolution of the celestial spheres in 1543, insisted on their purely hypothetical nature. He said, The hypothesis of the movement of the earth is only one which is useful to explain phenomena, but it should not be considered as an absolute truth. It was never his intention, it seems, that his theory should be taken in earnest by his successors. The motion of the Earth in space can be disproved by a comparison between the supposed speed of the Earth and that of the other planets. If we base our considerations on the principle that a body in motion creates an apparent speed equal to its own in bodies it encounters, which is usually demonstrated by the experiment of a moving vehicle such as a train, it is difficult to judge at first sight whether it's the train or what can be seen outside it which is moving away. But one fact is certain, that the two speeds, one of which is real and the other is apparent, are equal. For this reason, if the Earth were in motion, it would create in the planets and constellations an initial apparent speed equal to its own. Consequently, there can be no speed in the heavens lower than that of the Earth, since it represents a basic speed from which the apparent motions would be derived. But as it can be seen, the displacement of the constellations and of the planets, with the exception of Mercury and Venus, is slower than the supposed speed of the Earth, which under the circumstances stated above is a material impossibility. It should, moreover, be considered that the real speeds of the planets have to be added to the apparent motions created by the supposed movement of the Earth, with the result that the planets ought to pass before us like a flash of lightning. The absence of these mathematical circumstances, which surely have no reason to be invisible, ought to be sufficient to prove that the hypothesis of the revolution of the Earth around the Sun, as put forward by Copernicus, has no basis in fact and is not admissible, even if such theory could not be replaced by anything more logical as it is. An entirely different and more rational explanation of the cycle of the seasons, based on a reasoned investigation of existing conditions can, however, be given, so that it will no longer be necessary to send the Earth traveling into space to this end. The essential feature of the year is its division into two equal periods of six months, based first on the predominating length of the days over that of the nights, and vice versa. Conditions which are governed by the varying hours of sunrise and sunset, and secondly, 
by the either high or low height reached by the sun in the heavens at midday. The first cycle, during which the days are longer than the nights and the sun reaches its culminating point of the year, extends from the spring equinox to the autumn equinox, i.e. March 21 to September 22, and the second cycle during which, inversely, the duration of the nights exceeds that of the days, and the sun descends to its lowest point of the year, extends from the autumn equinox to the spring equinox, i.e. September 23 to March 20. These two six-month periods are also characterized by an opposition of temperature. During the first cycle, which corresponds to spring and summer, the heat gradually rises and falls, while during the second cycle, which comprises autumn and winter, it is the intensity of the cold which progressively increases and decreases. It might be said that it is low. It might be said that it is evident that the heat of the summer and the low temperatures of the winter result from either the high or low heat reached by the sun at midday, and also from the alternate predominating length of the days over the nights. Although it might not be absolutely certain that the variations of temperature are entirely due to these particular circumstances. To what reason must be attributed the variations which exist in regard to the sun's daily height and the hours at which it rises and sets, which seem to determine the various temperatures of the year? These regular fluctuations must necessarily have an origin, and it might be remarked that no scientific research or speculation has ever been attempted in this direction. The sun has been compared by the ancients to a chariot drawn by steeds and to a boat manned by rowers, meaning by this that it is not self-propelled. Its movement, therefore, is derived from some external power, and in that case it would appear that the variations in the height of the sun and its hours of rising and setting are due to the passage and to the impulsion of two regular successive currents, or cosmic breath streams, of six months each i.e. a warm increasing and decreasing breath stream prevailing from the spring equinox to the autumn equinox, followed by a cold increasing and decreasing breath stream from autumn to spring. And the conclusion is that the impulse of these two summer and winter cosmic breaths govern the height of the sun, and that they also have the effect of either advancing or retarding the hours of sunrise and sunset, on which the depend the respective lengths of days and nights. So it's interesting to note here, that it may not be the it may not be that the cosmic breath streams are governing the height of the sun, but they may be a function of the height of the sun. It is therefore the arrival and growing intensity of the warm summer breath stream which from March twenty one causes the sun to gradually ascend to its culminating point of the year at the June solstice, and the decreasing intensity of the same warm stream which, after the solstice, causes the height of the sun to decline steadily until twenty two September, the moment of the equinox when the cold current sets in. At the same time, the impulse of this warm cosmic stream has the effect of advancing the hour of sunrise and retarding that of sunset, so that the days become longer than the nights. On the other hand, it is the arrival and growing intensity of the cold winter breath stream about the 23rd September, which causes the sun to further descend to its lowest point of the year at December solstice, and the decreasing intensity of this cold breath which, after the winter solstice, causes the sun to rise again until 21 March, when the warm breath takes over. At the same time, the cold current has the effect of retarding the hour of sunrise and of advancing the sunset, whereby nights become longer than the days. As it can be seen, these two semi-annual cosmic streams, or currents, warm and cold, each represent a complete breath comprising a rising phase of inspiration from the equinox to the solstice, and a following phase of expiration from the solstice to the following equinox. And it's these two double phases of a duration of three months each, controlling the daily height of the sun and the hours of its rising and setting, which causes the four seasons. It may be explained that the principle of the existence of cosmic breaths is not new, and that it is to be found in the cosmogonies of the Orient, it has, here in particular, been borrowed from a French translation of Hindu texts in which the movement of the sun was said to respond to the influence of universal streams, of breath. The author has adapted this theory to existing circumstances, thus permitting the specific respiratory nature of these cosmic breaths to be discovered. This fact is completely demonstrated apart from the obvious parallel of the phases of inspiration and expiration rhythmically governing the lengths of days and nights and the height of the sun by a comparison with another factor, which is the pause existing between inspiration and expiration.
This pause is precisely reproduced by the solstice, which corresponds to the stoppage of the cosmic breath between the two phases. The existence of a breath governing the movement of the sun becomes here manifest. Since the height of the latter at midday does not vary during the solstice interval, nor do the hours of its rising and setting. The respective lengths of the day and of the night remain unchanged, the sun rising and setting at the same hours for no less than five days. It could be added, as further proof of the existence of a cosmic breath, that the high temperatures of July and August, which are really abnormal, since it should be cooler as they occur, when the days become shorter and the height of the sun decreases, that they are due, in fact, as in the function of respiration, the pressure of the breathing out is greater towards the middle of the expiration phase, and consequently, the temperature rises. On the other hand, it is observed that the cold becomes more intense in January and February. Although the days are growing longer and the decrease in the intensity of the cold breath is causing the sun to rise. This recrudescence of the cold is due to the same reason of pressure increase in the middle of the phase of expiration. And the cosmic breath being cold, it follows that there is a further drop of temperature during this period, from which it can be seen that the pressure of the respective cosmic breath streams is susceptible of warming or cooling in the atmosphere, as the case may be, regardless of the height of the sun. It may be remarked that during the time of the solstices, when the height of the sun at midday is stabilized for a few days, either at its highest or lowest point in the heavens, man, by reflex, follows the cosmic conditions by stopping his working activities and taking a rest in fall. These particular moments are also the occasion of great religious Christic festivals, Christmas at the winter solstice and Corpus Christi at the time of the summer solstice which points undoubtedly to the existence of an association between the Son and Christ. This association exists also in the case of the Easter festival of the resurrection of Christ, which in reality celebrates the solar new year. Easter takes place on the Sunday following the new moon, after the spring equinox on March 21, which date marks the beginning of the spring and summer cycle of the sun. When the height of the latter at noon begins to rise over the equator according to the actual astronomical way of reckoning the solar declination. It is also obvious that the opposition of the seasons north and south of the equator result from a corresponding opposition in the circulation of the two breaths around the Earth, i.e. when the warm breath is in the northern hemisphere, the cold one is in the other, and vice versa, so that it is simultaneously summer in one part of the world and winter in the other. Thus, the warm six-month breath which commenced in the northern hemisphere at the spring equinox comes to an end at the autumn equinox, about the 22nd of September when the transposition of the warm and cold breath takes place. The warm breath passes in the southern hemisphere for the spring-summer cycle, and at the same time the cold breath leaving said hemisphere enters ours for the autumn-winter cycle. The respective intensities of the two breaths, both at the end of their expiration phase at the moment are, thus, equalized, so as to permit their transposition. And at the same time, the lengths of the day and night find themselves also equalized to 12 hours each in both hemispheres. It is also most probable that the atmospheric disturbances which prevail at the time of the equinoxes are due to the mutual replacement of the breaths, and to their passage in a different part of the world. It should be added, however, that in the above theory concerning the cycle of the seasons, the cosmic breaths do not act directly on the sun, but that there are intermediate circumstances which will be dealt with later on with regard to the origin itself of the sun. Okay, so coming back from that from the cosmic breath streams, we can see how it's a great description and we can see how it works very easily and makes sense to some extent. Obviously some of the working factors of it would still be need, need to be worked out. So what I think is happening or a possible part of this is let, as you see here, I'm showing you this this is the weather patterns over the Earth. See how on the outside here, which would be the southern latitudes, it's moving in this direction, but in what we call the northern latitudes, really the central latitude, the center, central ring over the Earth, we see that the weather is moving in this direction. It's moving the opposite way. So this again ties in with those breath streams that she's talking about. And it's interesting, if you look at the four corners of the Earth like this, and we think of the four cosmic breath streams, you could see how if they were blowing from this way, from these two directions, east and 
well, okay, let's just call it left and right. And if it was blowing in those directions at different altitudes, and then it was blowing in these directions from north and south here, or top up and down, top and bottom of the picture, that if the breath was being pushed from there, from also from different altitudes, what you would create is sort of this, this toroidal vortex of air in the center. And you see how that, that would create the four winds. But also, see how they're moving in opposite directions in the north and the south here. It's very hard to explain how that would work, unless if you look at and consider that the dome itself would possibly be separated here and that one part of the dome or one portion is moving in this direction and one is moving in the other. And it would also, if you think about pumps and you think about pneumatics and how to move air, if you have two pieces of glass like that with some sort of a, a buffer in between them or a, a, an airtight seal in between them, and as you turn it, you would create suction and pressure which would create could create the forces of the wind that we're looking at and talking about. So, just lots more interesting stuff to look at that makes more sense to me for our flat earth model and makes much more sense to me than than obviously the globe model which is ludicrous, ridiculous. So, I hope you guys can see how that ties in there with the glass or the that that would that would make the pump action to create these cosmic breath streams. So after that is created, after it creates the breath streams, that the water cycles on Earth will be a similar, not similar, but but that they would run on the same principles and at the same timings. That it would be interlinked and correlated as far as timing. So the water would be part of this action of suction and the, the action of moving the air. So as the water is drawn into the the whirly pool at the North Pole here, this gigantic whirly pool, and as it circles around Mount Meru and plunges down into the depths of the earth, that would create that suction and pull the air towards that area. And then other air would have to come in from the outside or from the other parts of of the planisphere to fill in and make up for the diffusion and make up for the loss of those that sucked air that's going in at the north here. So what we see on Flat Earth and in reality is that diffusion and particle physics are really the the theories and the, the physics that work on our physical plane. Particle theory and particle physics over many years has been shown to be the true functioning of atomic theory. When you take a candle and light it, what you see is that the hot air rises and that cool air is sucked in at the base of the candle to fill in for where that hot air is being ejected or being raised. And that creates a quick, simple convection current. And we see this every day in all of our lives, in everything that we do. Particle diffusion, moving from high to low density, is how the world works. This is how the atmosphere works. This is how things actually work. And this is why, and explains how, rocketry and the true physics that are involved in spaceflight come into play because diffusion rules on flat earth when you get up to that altitude and there are no more particles to suck in or blow through a jet or to propel yourself off of from a rocket because there are no particles there you therefore have no push from the rocket.
you have no propulsion because there is nothing to propulse yourself or propel yourself off of. So to summarize, and in conclusion, this is how the tides actually work. They're not pulled by the moon, they're not pulled by magnetism, it's the cosmic cycles that the earth does with itself with the dome, air particle diffusion, the water movement, and suction, and pneumatics, and this is how the tides actually function. Thanks for watching, guys. Talk to you soon.